Well, hello, everyone, and uh, good evening and uh, good morning if you're on the other side of planet Earth, and or it's uh, maybe it's good afternoon for some of you. Uh, I want to welcome you all to uh, Toronto Apologetics. It's great to have you along, and uh, we have a great show tonight. Um, Toronto Apologetics, as you probably know, is committed to the defense of the Christian gospel. Uh, we are here. We're not the only ones, obviously, but we are here uh, among many other apologetic channels to give reasons for the Christian faith, uh, to uh, answer difficult questions related to the Christian faith, to defend the Christian faith against its critics, whether it's Muslims, whether it's the cults, the whether it's Judaism, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, whatever it may be. We deal with political issues as well. So we would encourage you to uh, subscribe to the channel. It's absolutely free. Uh, just hit the, uh, the the bell icon, subscribe, and like the video. Um, so tonight we are going to be dealing with a very, very important topic, uh, one that is uh, close to my heart and close to, uh, obviously, the hearts of many uh, Reformed Christians and those who are um, Christians of the Evangelical Protestant Persuasion. And we're going to be talking about the very important topic of justification, uh, particularly justification by faith alone. Uh, and so um, I have with me tonight uh, my dear brother in Christ and uh, a, a dear friend and a, a fellow apologist uh, that we've had on the channel before. He is no stranger uh, to this channel. So I want to bring on my good friend, uh, Anthony Rogers. Anthony, how are you doing there, brother? I'm doing great. And awesome. always, always, always excited and uh, delighted to be on with you. So thank you, Anthony. And I want to wish you a, uh, a happy birthday. I understand it's your birthday, and it's not just your birthday, but it's your wife's birthday as well. Yes. Yeah, so I do have to lamentably tell everyone there's uh, no more shopping days left for our birthday. So it's it's too late. It's too late if you were planning on presents. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, yeah, we have the same birthday. So. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Well, you'll always have the same wedding anniversary. That's a given. But uh, but it, it's it's good to it's good to know that it's your birthday. You won't forget your birthday, and she won't forget hers. Uh, so that's wonderful. So uh, happy birthday to you, Anthony, and uh, pray that the Lord grant you many more years of life to serve Him and and bring glory to Him. So uh, Anthony, I was I was originally planning to uh, discuss the topic of justification by faith alone because uh, three days ago uh, you were scheduled to have a debate. Uh, with Roman Catholic apologist William Elbrecht, uh, whom I've debated as well before and who I know. And so uh, that debate didn't happen. It, it fell through. And uh, to, the, to the shock of many folks who are so looking forward to it, it was a, a bit of a disappointment. But uh, what exactly happened there, Anthony? Uh, why, did it, why did it fall through? Yeah, so there's actually a much longer backstory here. Uh, back in October 31st, I did a show addressing one claim made by Roman Catholics, namely that the Protestant reformers were introducing a theological novelty when they said that we're justified by faith alone. Now, right. one might have assumed that if an apostle or even the Lord Jesus Christ himself said it, even without those words, just like we believe in the Trinity, uh, even though the word's not found in the Bible, then that would be sufficient to say this has ancient uh, groundings for it. Right. But in any case, I, I, I mentioned that it's found in numerous early fathers and that set off a number of parties mm -hmm. and eventually led one person who didn't think he was adequate to the task to challenge me to debate William. So William was sort of like the first pawn in this individual's game. And, and uh, anyways, I, I was happy to do that and I'm happy to debate it with anybody. Uh, to me, it is the principal hinge on which the relig uh, the Christian religion turns, as Calvin said, and it's the very grounds of my hope and confidence before God, and, and I think the ground and hope of Christians everywhere, all true Christians. So uh, anyways, I said, yeah, let's, let's do this. And initially I thought, okay, this is November that you're now challenging me. Maybe we could do it as soon as December, if that works for you. He kept saying, no, 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 that wasn't going to work. It'd have to be later, later, later. And eventually we settled on March 19th. And I thought, OK, five months uh, I'll, I'll give you, you know, to prepare, even though the parties on the other side of this were were not, you know, they, they weren't trying to bite their tongues. Let's just say they were calling me a Protestant dog, saying they were going to muzzle me. 
calling themselves lions and so forth. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll march right up into your lion's den. And wouldn't you know it, the, before the, the, the stone sealed it and uh, so forth, they had already fled from the den, right? So I'm in there all alone waiting for this debate to happen. Anyways, March 19th came and he said the day before that his wife was in an accident and he wouldn't be able to do it because she was going to need surgery. And I didn't try to, you know, make sport of that. I, I hope the best for his wife. I assumed in all charity that he was telling the truth. And, you know, I just realized, you know, it's not my job to try and figure that out. If it, if he was lying, then he has to answer to God. And if it was true, then my, my best wishes to him and his wife and, and, and so forth. Well, then I started getting suspicious, though, that even if this were the case, that he was going to use it as an occasion to really stall the debate. And so every time I try and contact him, he kept saying, you know, I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you. Well, at one point he did suggest May 27th. And even though I had a conference to do, I was going to agree to it because I thought I'll just do the debate in my hotel room, you know, but right. next thing you know, uh, that debate wasn't going to work for him or that date wasn't going to work for him either. And so uh, we never really officially agreed to May 27th. And he said, okay, let's do it June 20th. So then we told Marlon, who was going to moderate the debate, that we have both agreed to June 20th. Mm -hmm. And Mar this was back in early May, right? So Marlon put up a link to the debate. Everybody knew on both sides. You know, I, I it's crazy that, uh, well, so, so what happened though, and I didn't even tell people about this part of it. You know, I, I haven't even bothered trying to be very, uh, zealous to, to prove that he's lying. Although I've given, I think sufficient evidence, but there's mo more to it. But what happened was, uh, Marlon initially said, Hey, I got a new job. My schedule's a little different. Can we push it off a couple of days? And I thought no problem to me if we push it off a couple of days, but my problem is I think this will be used as another excuse to say, Oh, we need to push it off even further because I don't have an opening. You know, so that was right. my concern. And so remember the date was, that was agreed on was 620. Well, what happened was when Mar uh, Marlon then came back at like the same day or something and said, Oh, never mind. I don't have to switch my schedule. So we're still on. And William, who I was supposed to debate said, Oh, uh, too late. I already rescheduled something to, to that slot. So on 621, I'm going to be debating and I can't, I can't do the debate anymore with Anthony that day. And I mm -hmm. said, Oh, this is perfect. William. I said, because we never agreed on 621. We agreed on 620. Right. And he said, he said, Oh, he goes, you're not listening to me. He says, I've already rescheduled something for 621. And I said, no, William, you're not listening to me. We agreed to debate 620. Yeah. So you penciled in the wrong day. So if you were trying to make sure that date couldn't be returned to, you made the wrong choice, you know? Uh, right. So, but then here's the irony. I didn't see any debate from William on 621. He did debate today but he didn't debate on 621 the day that he thought was our agreement. Uh, it was just a mess really. So right. I, I don't get it. Right. I mean, I was a yeah. Protestant dog. that was going to be muzzled and they, you know, I've let them lie and besmirch my, besmirch my character, say all sorts of things about me, you know, make up certain things, take things out of context. I just thought, Hey, we'll bring it all to the debate. And yeah. my principal concern is not my own honor or glory. You can call me whatever you right. want, discredit me in their eyes. But I will demonstrate from the Bible that this is the gospel. And so right, right. I don't know why they're not. Yeah, I mean, all this, all these shifting in dates, uh, Anthony, it reminds me of the Watchtower. You know, they they keep saying well, Armageddon is going to be uh, 1914, no, 1918, 1925, 1975, 1941, and so forth. So, uh, yeah, it almost sounds like uh, what we find usually in the Watchtower Society. Uh, but, Anthony, I, I, I mean, I was following this very closely, and um, I noticed uh, – because I've been on Marlon's channel, uh, on his um, on his YouTube channel, or his Facebook, it seems, um, on May the 5th. I've even circled it there. And I think you showed this image before as well on your channel. But very clearly there, May the 5th, um, Marlon of Gospel Truth uh, announced the highly anticipated debate. And he tagged both you and William in blue there. Um, <laughs> and everything seemed, I mean, there was plenty of time. If there was any disagreement on that date there was plenty of time to to change it. So uh, I just find it odd that uh, Marlon put this out quite early uh, on the 5th of May and, uh, you know, Cinco de Mayo. Uh, and then um, 
for some reason, it sounded like the 20th was not a go. That That's why I found very strange. Yeah. I mean, there's several things here. Number one, as you pointed out, that's May 5th. That disproves William's claim that he, he was trying to tell people that we agreed to debate the 27th and then I backed out. I never right. backed out of anything. And he's got no evidence for that. It won't supply any evidence for that. That was never, though, a date that we publicly agreed on, even though we were trying to work out that date. The date we agreed on was 620. And you see there, May 5th is when that was announced, well before the 27th. Right. And he's tagged in it, which means that the, the message was sent to him that this is what Marlin is advertising. Moreover, right. both of our, you know, the people that watch me, the people that watch him all knew about this. They're all commenting. People were commenting, you know, when you put up a link to like even the broadcast now, when you put up the link, people were able to leave comments in the chat, sure. in the live chat. And, uh, you know, I'd periodically check in and I'd see people commenting, people that were following him. On my show, I kept announcing that the debate was coming up. Uh, there's just no way he didn't know. And it's just a farce. And in any case, it, here's the question. One question I would ask William's dutiful followers. If June 20th wasn't the date, what date do we do agree on? Well, where's that date, right? Nobody can pretend that I haven't yeah. been chomping at the bit for this. So are we just supposed to believe that, uh, I don't know, since November, there's never been any agreed upon to date besides March 19th, of course, right. which he backed out on. I mean, it's just, just crazy. I'd rather just get to the debate. For me at this point, it seems more like I, I'm, you know, William's not going to like this, but I seriously think that it's going to prove to have been more of a challenge to get William to debate than to actually debate him on this topic. Right, right. right. Well, uh, I know that it was also uh, posted here. I believe this is a Facebook posting, May 5th again. Uh, and there, uh, Marlon also repeats the the same thing. Um, so that that's too bad, Anthony, because I, I know that you were looking forward to that. I know that you prepared in advance, you, you, you've been doing a series on, on Galatians and everybody, uh, if you don't know Anthony Rogers, uh, there's, a, there's a link to his channel in the description box. You guys go and uh, check out Anthony's uh, channel there. And I know you've been working on, on Galatians and I think you did a superb job, Anthony, when you were dealing with the, uh, the church father, uh, Victor Rhinus, uh, from the fourth century, the early fourth century. Uh, and you could have mentioned uh, um, Ambrose Aster as well, who also uh, talked about uh, so, uh, uh, salvation by faith alone and without works and so forth and so on. And 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 Augustine's written on this as well, uh, and, and he's been very clear on this uh, as well. But um, I just I think that uh, you were you were well you were well grounded. Uh, you you had Vectorinus under your belt and so forth, and and you had the text of scripture. So. It really is disconcerting that uh, that that William would have backed out of this. I, I just there's no rhyme or reason uh, for this cancellation. Yeah, and let me just say with re with respect to the church fathers. Now, William and I, as far as the actual debate thesis, the debate thesis is: uh, Do the Bible and the church fathers teach justification by faith? Right. So we're going to have an opportunity to look at both of those. Now, I've never made it anything but clear that my ultimate confidence is that the text of scripture teaches this. Right. I don't for a minute think that the fathers always spoke consistently with each other, or even that any particular father was always consistent with himself. You mentioned sure. Augustine a moment ago, Augustine wrote a whole book called retractationes, which means mm -hmm. retractions or rethinking. Yep. Uh, and so Augustine was looking back on his earlier writings and saying, Hey, look, I disagree with this Augustine character. You know what, what he said 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and he's talking about himself. So, uh, but uh, yeah, there are noteworthy fathers who were as clear as day on this issue, like Marius Victorinus. And, but, you know, so William and I were going to debate this and the fathers that I cited just to show that there was some earlier precedent for this in church history were only the tip of the theological iceberg. Yeah. And none of the fathers, as far as I can think at the moment that I quoted back then that led to this debate were even the ones that I chose to uh, specifically focus on in my upcoming debate with William. So that's just a way of saying this is so rich in, in the early fathers that I can easily, you know, give a three hour lecture as I did on the fathers and then turn around and, and quote entirely different fathers to make the same point. Mm -hmm. And so anyways, yeah, it's, it's, it's there. Um, 
And I, I was anxious. I, I've been preparing, you know, just uh, thought that uh, the, the guys that, uh, you know, had so many nasty things to say would have been willing to, you know, come mm -hmm. on and, and, and make good some of those claims. Yeah. And, and if this is the consensus of the fathers, we keep hearing that 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 term being bantered about, which really, at the end of the day, there's very little that's the consensus other than the fundamentals of our faith. Um, it's just interesting that, I mean, if you have the consensus of the fathers on your side, then this would be, uh, it'd just be a smackdown debate uh, on, on, on Elbrick's part. But it's just very strange that, uh, once again, I mean, if you've got the evidence on your side, then, then bring it forth, bring it to the table. Um, so it, it seems very un, uh, highly doubtful, uh, Anthony, that we're, we're ever going to see you to debate. Yeah. Um, I was looking at one of the comments, sort of distracted me. But, uh, you know, you mentioned the consensus of the fathers following my statement about that. Uh, e e you can find papal declarations about the fact that there isn't, with respect to the interpretation of particular passages, many passages on which you have a consensus of the fathers, right? So even when you're talking about, let's say, uh, if you're talking about doctrinal issues, like you said, and on certain main things, you'll find uh, consensus, like the Trinity, the deity of right. Christ, or something like that. Uh, after you get past some of these core things, the consensus starts to fall apart. And then when you look, even when you look at particular passages, though, even with respect to the Trinity and deity of Christ, you'll find different approaches that certain fathers had to those texts. So say, take, for example, uh, one text that people often throw at us in the Olivet Discourse when Jesus said, nobody knows the day or the hour. Even today, Christians will give different answers to that. But I, I no. found eight different interpretations no. among the fathers on that. Yeah. Right? There's not a consensus there. And moreover, the vast majority of what they're doing is just plain, they're trying to exegete the text, the same thing anybody can do today. They have no advantage over anybody in that respect, right? It's one thing if a uh, early church father says, you know, I saw John and John said this. Right. It's another thing when somebody's saying, it says in the book of Philemon X, and it means this. I mean, at that point, they're just doing exegesis. Yeah. Right. Which uh, yeah. it, it, it's right or wrong based on its uh, conformity to the, the text, the rules of grammar, uh, the syntax, the context and that sort of thing. Right. So uh, anyways. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, just take Matthew 16, 18, 16, <laughs> 16 to 18. I mean, the debate about what is, what is this rock that Christ is going to build his church on? I mean, you know, Augustine says it's the confession of faith. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Others would say, no, it's Christ himself. And others would say, well, it's Peter representing the whole church. And so even in the question of, of who is the rock of Matthew 16, there is a, there's a, there's a, a, a wide spectrum of, of various views on this. Uh, and even after Nicaea, as you know, Anthony and Nicaea, uh, homoousios was the language used uh, to talk about that the son is of the same nature as the father. Uh, and of course, the Arians said it was it was a completely different nature, heterousios. But then you got these guys in the middle with the homoousios, like Eusebius, for example, uh, who was a friend of Constantine, was trying to, uh, in a sense, he was trying to uh, be in the middle. Uh, and 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 when you think of the fact that even after the Council of Nicaea, the whole empire went Arian for a while. Now, and 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 so there's a lot of shifting that's going on. Um, and it's very clear from, from any deep study of the fathers that, you know, Irenaeus thought Jesus was 50 years old when he died. Uh, and he claimed he got that from apostolic authority from the apostles themselves. Now, I don't mm -hmm. know anyone, I don't know any Roman Catholic scholar today, Protestant or even Orthodox, uh, who believes Jesus was 50 years old, uh, when he died. Uh, so clearly, um, you know, to speak of a consensus, it, it seems that the, the, the denominations that are talking about a consensus seem to be mainly the Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church to give themselves this footing in ancient history that we are the ancient church yeah. and so forth. And, and neither one of them thinks the other is actually part of the true church. You know, you have it to be exactly. if we're talking about, a, you know, an Eastern Orthodox person who's still advocating classic Eastern Orthodox viewpoints. I was reading an Eastern Orthodox person 
uh, just the other day where she kept talking as if other people were Christians. That's not standard fare no. in Eastern Orthodoxy. No. No. You have to be an Eastern Orthodox person or else you're not a Christian. Correct. And the same thing is true with respect to the Roman Catholic Church. Historically, certainly from the standpoint of Trent, you know, if you're not a Roman Catholic, you, you just are outside the true church. Right. And we have to remember, so it, it's kind of funny. I was thinking the other day about Rome's attempts to mollify people by saying that the anathemas of Trent just mean excommunicated, right? <laughs> They're not saying you're under God's curse. That's not true. But but no. still, remember, according to classic Roman theology, outside of the church, the visible church, there is no salvation. Mm -hmm. And so even if they're saying only that you're excommunicated, the entailment of that is you are damned. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I actually have a lot more respect for certain set of a contest Roman Catholics. Uh, for example, uh, one, uh, Peter Diamond, he's debated William a number of times and uh, he's taken William to task uh, on some of these things. He's pointed out that even from the traditional Roman Catholic perspective, the current Pope is Antichrist. He's not a true Catholic. He's a heretic. Yep. And it's kind of fun watching these guys, who both of whom are, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> lost with respect to the truth of the gospel. But, yep. uh, you know, at least uh, they they're able to have this discussion where I, I think the set of a contest has a good case to make that even present pope popes are uh, departing from classic uh, Roman Catholic thought, the Council of Florence, uh, yeah. the, the Council of Trent, N this whole idea of Protestants as separated brethren, that, that's just poppycock from a Tridentine perspective. When, when the Council of Trent says that Protestants are anathema, it's not just saying, hey, brother, you know, we, we wish you didn't live next door and would yeah. just move in with us. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's not yeah. what they're saying. No, definitely. And you can't read, uh, you know, Unum Sanctum by Pope Boniface. Uh, the 8th uh, in 1302 is very clear that it is necessary for every human creature to be submissive to the Roman pontiff in order to be saved. Uh, right. They're not missing any words there. They're very, they're very direct. And so it's no surprise that as you, as you pointed out, Anthony, after Vatican II in the 1960s, it's no surprise the city of Aconis came out and said, uh, this church has gone apostate and the, and, and the seat of Peter is vacant. Thus the word city vacant. The, the, yeah. the seat of Peter is vacant until a rightful pope returns. And so uh, so the, the, this unity we keep hearing about uh, is, is a farce because there's a lot of division uh, even within Roman Catholicism. Yeah, so it's it's nice to see that uh, there are a set of Acontas recognizing this, but if they had just listened to the reformers, they could have, you know, it, it reminds me, of, remember the old joke where people were talking about, uh, I don't remember exactly how it goes, but it's... Uh, scientists getting to the top of a mountain right yeah. you remember this joke yeah, yeah. Uh, uh well yeah it's kind of like the, you know, the reformers were already there yeah. there's a band of reformers yeah. already up there on top of the mountain after they yeah. scale the the cliffs of of knowledge and, and so forth well this leads me to this anthony i don't know if you saw this in the news but uh just talking about roman catholicism and the papacy this uh, just came out um uh, a couple of days ago on june, june the 17th uh, uh in bologna in italy uh, which I, I would say is baloney, but uh, the first gay blessing in Italy, Diocese of Italian pr uh, Bishops President, it goes on to say first the first civil union at the registry office, then the blessing in church. It's the first time a gay couple has been blessed in public in an Italian church. What's more, it took place in Bologna, which is the Diocese of Cardinal Zuppi, the president of the Italian Bishops Conference, an act which is open violation of the responsum of the congregation for the doctrine of the faith, which forbids such blessings. It's a demonstration of the Pharisaic hypocrisy of certain pastors who, instead of calling the sheep back, proudly lead them on the road to perdition. And so it's quite shocking uh, when I read this, Anthony, because uh, we're told that the bishops in the Roman church are the successors of the apostles and that the pope is the successor of Peter uh, and that the Holy Spirit will never lead his church into error. Um, and here we have something that, by the way, Pope Francis did not object to civil unions between gay people. Marriage, no, at least for now. But the fact that, that this is happening uh, in the Roman church today, um, 
it's interesting that when this is brought forward to people at Catholic Answers or other places, you know what the song and dance is, Anthony? Well, the Pope did not pronounce this to be ex cathedra from the chair. The Pope doesn't have to pronounce something to be a sin if God has already judged it. God has already passed judgment on this. So uh, do you have any comments on that? Just <laughs> a I, I little you're, more. You're, yeah, you're trying to get off the uh, trying to get off the floor, I guess, after reading that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just uh, the the song and dance is it gets old, right? I mean, uh, when when it's like uh, you know, years ago, Anthony Flew, who was a famous agnostic, eventually yeah. became something of a deist, not a full fledged uh, theist, yeah. but uh, he recognized the holes in agnosticism but back in his agnostic days he mentioned that from his perspective and the perspective of many unbelievers the claims that certain theists make end up dying the death of a thousand qualifications right and, and what he meant was kind of like you know he, he gave this illustration of a garden um where or you know he gave this yeah i think it was a garden where he was saying that um Theists claim that there's a gardener that is responsible for this. Right. And then the atheist or agnostic comes along and says, where is the gardener? I never see the gardener. Mm. And then the Christian says, oh, he's invisible. And then you say, you know, then they say, OK, so, uh, you know, he brings up another issue to try and establish the existence of this gardener. And then another qualification is supposedly in interjected by the theist. And he says, eventually, the original claim just doesn't seem to be much of a claim it's been qualified to death and right. we have adequate answers to that sort of thing but i i do think of that particular thing when i see the roman catholics constantly backpedaling at every false statement made by a pope you know it's almost like the guy could never possibly speak fallibly without it being irrelevant to the claim of papal infallibility like how do you right. ever disprove that sort of thing and and if it, it if it's if the popes are only speaking infallibly under you know all these hundreds of qualifications how does anybody i mean how's that ever useful yeah. right i mean uh, it ends up looking like he's only spoken infallibly a couple of times you know so what use is that and yeah. you know it, it also goes to this issue of catholics often like to they, they like to speak in generalities so, for example, when they want to argue against sola scriptura, they'll say it's unworkable because Protestants will disagree with each other on the interpretation of a verse. Now, we believe that the disagreement arises because somebody's not being faithful to sound principles of hermeneutics. It's right. not because the text itself, there's some flaw there or anything like that. The flaw is not in the book. It's in the people. Right. And but in any case, the the Roman church, they'll say, oh, we have a infallible pope an infallible magisterium and so forth. And yet very seldom does that guy ever speak infallibly or that office. And when that office does supposedly speak infallibly, well, what we end up with are a hundred different Roman Catholic interpretations of those things. Look at the example of the, uh, the statement regarding the Romish church's relationship with Muslims and Islam. Yeah. You know, they worship the, the same adorable God with us. Yeah. Yeah. You know, look at Roman Catholics bouncing off each other like Keystone cops trying to explain that. You know, you've got, you know, some being very conservative, want to take it one way. Some being very liberal, want to take it another way. Where's yeah. the infallible church uh, settling yeah. this matter? You know, they created the problem. Right. People are debating yeah. over their supposed interpretation. So, yeah. I mean, now you look at something like this and I, I think even the failure of the pope to speak to that. And I haven't chased down this whole story or whatever, but even a failure to speak to it, to me, is irresponsible and already points up a serious issue with yeah. claims pertaining to the Pope. Yeah, well, even even Vatican II says that um, says that atheists have uh, a chance of being saved, uh, even though they don't believe in <laughs> God. They have this baptism of desire. And uh, you remember a couple of years ago, there was a little child uh, who ran up to the Pope and he was crying that his daddy was a an atheist and uh, but he had them all has kids all baptized and so forth but he was an atheist and he asked the the pope is my daddy in heaven and the pope was of course he is absolutely your dad's in heaven uh, look, i mean look what he did he had you all baptized and so forth and so you know hebrews 11 says that he who comes to god must believe that he is and that that entails theism 
that God exists. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So uh, it, it is just a total mess, Anthony, a total mess. When you look at the present pope, I mean, it's very obvious. He has Marxist leanings uh, uh, in, in Argentina. He was connected to organizations that were Marxist in nature. He thinks that there, there, many of their uh, ideas were fine, uh, but you can see it when he applies this ideology to theology. It's an absolute catastrophe. It's an absolute mess. And there's been rumors floating around. Again, these are just rumors that uh, that uh, there's talk about him even uh, basically retiring. So there's going to be another Benedict XVI, uh, Pope Emeritus. So um, again, that's just a rumor right now, but uh, it is a complete mess. And so a lot of these Catholic yeah. uh, apologists, Roman Catholic apologists, are really, they seem to be in, in da damage control on, on full mode. Yeah. 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 I mean, I wouldn't, I don't envy their position. I mean, no. <laughs> but it, you know, it's not like it's one forced or imposed on them. Yeah. You know, they're the ones choosing to, uh, you know, put themselves in that context. Yeah. I mean, with us, uh, uh, Anthony, I mean, in the evangelical circles, if, if, if there's Protestant churches that uh, ordain gay clergy and, and marry gay, gay couples, I mean, we'll call them out and say they're not part of Christ's church. They're an apostate church. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. So we, we can at least say they're not part of, of Christ's sheep. Uh, but in the Roman Catholic Church, you got a bit of a problem here because these sacraments, particularly baptism, is a, is a sacrament that leaves an identifiable mark. It's an indelible mark that is placed on the, the, the Roman Catholic who receives baptism. And, and according to Roman Catholic theology, that mark cannot be erased. Uh, but at the same time, you can commit a mortal sin and go to hell, even though you've been marked with that indelible mark of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, the, the other thing, of course, is the, the, the problem with respect to the, the idea that that baptism as well as the other sacraments yeah. work by their own working right the, yeah. it's automatic yeah ex right? operato yeah yeah so uh <laughs> yeah they, they got problems on their hands as far yeah. as all this goes big time well anthony uh so let's deal with uh, uh even though this was very important that we were talking about here i wanted to talk about uh justification uh by faith alone and you mentioned earlier that Luther rightfully said that this is the foundation upon which the church stands or falls. And John Calvin said that it's the hinge upon which the Roman, the, the, the Christian religion moves. Um, so um, justification by faith alone. And of course we emphasize the alone there. Um, can you say a little bit about why, I mean, Luther rightfully called it this foundation and, and, and it's basically about how is a man, a sinful man, made right with the holy god uh, so maybe if you can just uh say a little bit about that and then we'll we'll look at uh what the word actually the greek word for justification what it entails afterwards yeah so as far as the importance one thing i like to point out to people is how different paul's uh, letter to the galatians is in its tone and so forth compared to what you might find in another epistle uh, even take take for example Paul's address to the Corinthians. The, the Corinthian church was a mess, right? Paul's looking at all these scandalous activities that people are engaged in, and he's reproving people, and he's saying, clean up this mess kind of thing. But Paul still addresses them as the church as a whole, as a body, he says this is the church, and you know, continues to apply the gospel to that situation, right? This is, this is what it looks like to live out the gospel uh, in relation to these issues, right? Uh, this is the consistent, yeah. uh, uh, you know, but when you turn to the epistle to the Galatians, it's altogether different. There are so many marked different. I mean, Paul has this characteristic style right, when he writes yeah. his epistles so that you could look, for example, at the introduction of Paul's epistle to the Romans, to the Corinthians, to the Philippians, to the Colossians, the Ephesians. And there's, there's all these elements that are in common. In fact, there are even stereotypical phrases like grace and peace to you from God, yeah. our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And so when you look at Galatians, just pick up any commentary and they'll note how striking it is that Paul departs at this point and at that point and at that point from his ordinary introductions. And one of the things that stands out in Paul's introduction, the first five verses to the Galatians, is 
he uses the term church, but it has to be remembered that the term in Greek, ekklesia, just referred to an assembly of people, a called out gathering. It took on its distinctively Christian uh, connotation because the Christians came to use it particularly for yeah. their gatherings. Yeah. And we retained it, you know, even outside of Greek speaking context. But, uh, you know, the, but usually because it had this general usage, it could be used for a gathering, a political gathering. It could be used for uh, gatherings at the Colosseum for yeah. entertainment. Yeah. Paul would ordinarily add some modifier, like he would say, churches of God, churches in Christ, or, or he'd call them saints, uh, and, and so forth. Paul does nothing of the sort when he addresses the Galatians. He just says to the churches in Galatia. Yeah. And it's not, that's when you, again, when you look at the pattern of Paul in his epistles, that's not insignificant. He's, he's, no. he's basically reserving or refraining from applying to them those distinctive terms that would de denominate them, not just congregations, but congregations of Christ. Right. And it's not that Paul has lost all hope for them, but it's questionable whether they've made the, the full uh, departure from the gospel that he has heard about. You know, he's heard that they're giving their ears to these other people that are preaching a different gospel. And he's concerned that they're in the process of deserting him who called them for a different gospel. Right. And then he tells them at some point in the epistle, if you get circumcised, that is with with this idea that it somehow contributes to your justification, then Christ is of no value to you. Right. Right. Paul's not saying if you get circumcised uh, just as a, you know, maybe a traditional practice or as a health custom, whatever you might want to do. That's that's whatever it is. You know, Paul didn't have mm -hmm. a problem with somebody getting circumcised, for example, uh, when, when he wanted to bring uh, somebody into the temple uh, who is, you know, not circumcised, sure. you'd have them circumcised. But not if, but as soon as somebody said this was necessary for salvation, Paul said all bets were off. Absolutely not. No circumcision. And, and so, again, I mean, the, my point here is just to say scandalous activity in Corinth calls for sharp rebuke from Paul, but he still calls them saints. Yeah. Right. And let a Roman Catholic, uh, you know, really wrestle with that one. Right. In the Roman yeah. Catholic Church, now that they've been so bombarded by Protestants, they'll, They'll have to say things like, oh, yeah, everybody's a saint in some yeah. sense, but it's not yeah. it's not characteristic for Roman Catholics. When they think of the term saint, it refers to a special class of people who have died, who were known for good works here on earth, who who went to heaven. And th there's like three criteria. They have to mm -hmm. uh, have done three confirmed miracles uh, or three confirmed miracles have to have taken place in there. I forget all the criteria, but, but they're special individuals that are officially recognized and canonized by Rome. Yep. That's not how Paul's talking. He's calling people saints because they're in Christ, right? Right. The Holy one they're set apart. Right. They're in him. And, but when he talks to the Galatians, because they are not single, you know, single mindedly focused on Christ, he doesn't call them churches. And he says that they're in the process of deserting the one who called them by the grace of Christ. And then he says of those who teach a false gospel, that they're yep. anathema. Yeah. And and so on. You know, so uh, this this is why this is so important. I mean, yeah, I, I I have people. My one last thing real quickly. I keep having people that tell me I shouldn't be putting so much stress on this, uh, especially when it comes to people that are perhaps also defending aspects of the Christian faith or maybe even going after false faiths to some degree. And I'm, I'm, I'm over here thinking, this is what Paul thought was the whole kit and caboodle. Lose this, you yeah. lose everything. And what is it that you're defending, if not the gospel? And what is it right. you're proclaiming to them, if not the gospel? Right. All those other things are, are really worthless apart from the gospel. If we don't have the gospel, we don't have anything. Absolutely. And and you can tell that Paul is peeved when he's writing Galatians. Uh, yeah, you know he's peeved because, uh, as as you rightfully said, the, his designation, his modifier there, uh, and also the fact that, you know, at the end, he talks about that those who would circumcise you, you know, they, they should just emasculate themselves, cut it all off. He gets very graphic there. But then he, at the very end, he says, look with what with such big letters, I write my name. In other words, Paul took it upon himself to say, look, I'm putting my imprimatur on this letter. Uh, and so Galatians is very distinct from the other letters in that Paul writes it out of urgency. 
Uh, and, and it's because the dividing line is not this, you know, C.S. Lewis mere Christianity, where we can all agree on the, on the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. That's not Paul's point here. The point is the gospel itself is the dividing line. And, and, and so this is what the Reformers saw. The Reformers understood this, that if you have the wrong gospel, then you don't have salvation. And that is why Paul reserves the strongest language there in Galatians. He uses the word anathema, which means to be under the divine curse of God. Uh, he uses that, and he he reemphasizes it, that it's not just a, a human delivering a different gospel, but even if an angel from heaven should come, uh, let that angel be condemned. And he puts the anathema on himself and the apostles when he said, if we come back, if we give you another gospel, then count us damned as well. So, so you're right, Anthony. Galatians is uh, a very distinctive letter, and and Paul is really uh, he's 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 putting investing his whole heart into this. Yeah, in fact, uh, the the word anathema is only used, as best I recall, five times in yeah. the New Testament, and four of them are used by Paul. One time is when certain Jews pronounce an anathema on themselves if they don't successfully take out Paul. Yeah. Right. So they're 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 all used the word anathema, all all, all those occurrences are somehow in relation to Paul, right? Yeah. Either I, I think those one guys died, by the way, Anthony. I think those guys eventually <laughs> starved to death, never caught Paul. Yeah. Yeah. So so Paul uh uses it four times, twice in Galatians, in two verses. Right. So he uses a very strong term. In fact, I did a show on this the other day where I pointed out where this comes from in the Old Testament. Yeah. But in effect, the Old Testament puts under the ban idolaters and Israel is deputized by God to go and inflict his wrath against them. Right. Right. Uh, God alone has the right to give and take life. Right. So when he delegates the right to Israel to execute his wrath against idolaters, this is what's referred to as these things being put under the ban, right. meaning that they're devoted to destruction. Correct. And uh, so Paul, when, when this, this is, again, a part of the point that I was driving the other day. When Paul pronounces anathema on people who preach a false gospel, by virtue of this Old Testament background, he's identifying those who have a false gospel as idolaters. Yes. Right. And it's probably not the way most people are used to thinking of idolatry. You know, we're used to thinking of it as perhaps uh, some people might think of it only as overtly worshiping a statue, a carved image or something like that. Right, Others right. might go as far as saying it's worshiping a false conception of God. So a, a sort of I, idol in the head, right? right. That hasn't been externalized into an object. But according to Paul and his language, if you don't have the gospel, you don't have the true God. And remember, remember the Galatians that he's writing to were idolaters prior to the gospel coming to them. Paul makes this point in Galatians 4 that if you listen to these Judaizers, he says then, uh, he says that formerly, you know, you worship those things that were by nature, not gods. But he says now, if he goes, why are you going to go back to this sort of thing? Right. He's, he's basically equating what the Judaizers are calling them to as a reversion to the same paganism that they were formerly enmeshed in. Now, somebody might say, well, how could returning to, let's say, the law be that sort of thing? Well, one thing I would point out here, and there's a lot more that could be said, but I'll point this out real quickly. It has to be remembered that uh, there's a difference between keeping the ceremonial prescriptions with a view to the one that they're pointing to. Right. I, I would argue, and this is the, the teaching of the apostle, that saints under the old covenant recognized that through these things, God was was teaching them the way of salvation. So Abraham had faith in Christ to come. Uh, Jesus said that. Right. John eight. Yeah. Abraham looked yeah. forward to seeing my day. He wasn't as theologically uninformed as some people might think. Right. The author of Hebrews says that people had the gospel preached to them in advance, but they didn't mix what they heard with faith. So the gospel was being preached throughout the ages, and part of the way it was being preached was through these types and shadows. Well, once the, the, the reality comes mm -hmm. and a person insists on clinging to the shadows, they are, in effect, denying the reality and clinging to the shadows, which, in effect, makes them out to be something that they're not, right? They never right. were the reality. 
and so again, I mean, there's a lot more packed into that, but there, there is a very real sense in which Paul associates anything like that with idolatry. Departure right. from the gospel is departure from the living God. Right, right. And of course, the law and the, the, the types and the shadows and so forth, all of these were pointers. They're pointing to Christ. And so the, the analogy, you know, in Colossians 2.16, Paul talks about how all of these things, the Sabbath and everything, were all pointing to Christ. And then he talks about how they were a shadow of things to come, but Christ is the substance or the body. And so uh, it's obviously a solid body that casts a shadow. Uh, anyone sees that on a sunny day. Uh, and, and so instead of running and embracing the, 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 the solid object, you know, if my wife was coming back from a trip and, and, and I went to the airport to pick her up and, and, and it's a beautiful sunny day and she's waiting for me and, and her shadow's being cast on the ground, this would be like me running and jumping on her shadow and kissing it and embracing it, you know, and then, you know, these little guys in white outfits would come and take me away to a, a comfortable place. And so why would you hug and embrace the shadow when the reality, the substance which casts that shadow is there? And so, um, and so Paul's whole point is, look, Christ is here. Embrace him. Uh, he is the one. He's the Passover. He's our Passover lamb. Uh, he's the tabernacle. God has tabernacled among us, amongst us in him. He is, he is uh, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and so forth. And so anything less than Christ, um, and, you know, Paul says, I care to know nothing among you, amongst you, uh, but Christ and him crucified. So I, I think it's very clear from, from Galatians that Paul is being very Christocentric, Christotelic. Christ is the end of the law to all those who believe unto righteousness. And so, uh, yeah, and that's why the centrality of Christ is so connected to justification as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh you told the illustration in a another way. Uh, I'll have to use that at some point. I, the way I always do it is just to say you have a picture of your wife and kids. Yeah. And uh, you know, I might look at the picture when they're not around, but once they come, if I'm over there just oogling over the picture, I, I think somebody is going to get upset. You know, my yeah. wife will. <laughs> you know. <laughs> For sure. Uh, so. Uh, yeah. And, and, and by the way, you know, it, it, by the same token, it's a good lesson for a Roman Catholic to learn as an aside that if I take a picture and I show it to you and I say, this is my wife, that doesn't literally mean it's my wife. Yeah. Right. It, yeah. She's it's not a made picture of, paper. of my wife. Yeah. She's not made yeah. of paper or film. Right. Yeah. And is right. she's not two dimensional. And uh, she did not you know, transubstantiate it, into that. So, yeah. 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 So. So, folks, if you have any questions, uh, we want to ask you guys to put a Q in the chat box, capital Q, put in your questions, and then uh, Anthony and I will uh, will get to them. So, Anthony, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the word justification, just give people a bit of a background here. If we look at the the standard Greek English lexicon of the New Testament, uh, it's 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 abbreviated form is BDAG uh, for Bauer, Danker, Arndt, and Gingrich, um, and that's not a disease or a virus. That's those are the names of actual scholars. Uh, who put this together, the word justification is dikaio, dikaio. And it means, according to the dictionary, page 249, to render a favorable verdict, to vindicate. It also means as activity of humans to justify, vindicate, treat as just. It's used especially of persons, and there's the word dikaiosthai, means to be acquitted, be pronounced and treated as righteous, and thereby become dikaios, that is just or righteous, Receive the divine gift of dikaiosune, which is the Greek word for justification through faith in Christ and apart from nomos, that is the word for law, as a, as a basis for evaluation. And so, folks, this is not, this isn't Anthony's uh, dictionary. It's not, I didn't write this in the dictionary. Uh, this is considered the standard go-to dictionary lexicon of the Greek New Testament that uh, New Testament scholars today use. That is the standard text. Um, did you want to add anything to that, Anthony, to that definition yeah. from BDAC? Well, one thing I would say is that any word can be used in a variety of ways, as you know, and uh, but you can't just, de even when it has a variety of meanings, you can't just pick whichever one you like, right? It has to fit the context. Right. And there's various things that are involved in determining something like that. But, but here's the interesting thing about the word or word group related to it's usually called the deke word group because the you know you see various forms there yeah uh dikaio dikaiusthai and so forth um but what's interesting is 
this word never means, never means to make righteous. Correct. It never means that. And that's the Roman Catholic doctrine. So sometimes, for example, Roman Catholics might try and show some place where the word righteous is being used in something other than a declarative sense. Nobody's claiming that the word is always being used in some declarative sense, right? In in the passages talking about how a person is justified, yeah, yeah. God is declaring the person just and and so forth. But uh, it, it just never means to make righteous. It, it doesn't right. mean that anywhere, and it can't mean that uh, in, in certain. You know, for example. Um, in Romans three, it says, "Let God be just and every man a liar." Right. Right. It's it's one of those you know form of the the deep word group. It doesn't mean, uh, or, or 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 actually later it's it says uh, so that you might be justified, right, when you speak and prevail when you judge. There's the word justified. Right. It, could would anybody say in their right mind that God is made righteous? That there's some process of moral yeah. transformation by which God goes from being unrighteous to being righteous? The very suggestion and even thought of that is absolute blasphemy. Okay, but that's the Roman Catholic view with respect to the meaning of the word in our case. And and again, it never means that. Here's another right. example in uh, Second or First Timothy three. It mentions that Christ is uh, manifested in the flesh or was manifested yeah. in the flesh. Yeah, 16. And then, yeah. then it says vindicated in or by the spirit. Right. Now, what's going on there is it's talking about Christ's crucifixion. He's crucified on the trumped up charge of blasphemy. Right. The, the religious leaders condemn his, him as guilty of blasphemy. Right. The resurrection shows what God thinks of Christ's claim right, to be the son of God. Right. They condemned him and put him to death for blasphemy, claiming to be the son of God. God says, yeah, my verdict is different. Right. I, I say, yes, he is. Right. Uh, and uh, but the word for vindicate there but manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit is the word justified. Correct. That's right. Does anybody think that Christ was taken from a state of sinfulness, inherent sinfulness to one of inherent righteousness? Again, the, the very suggestion or even thought of that is blasphemous. Right. And you won't find any uh, dictionary or lexicon uh, or any standard reference work in, in Greek grammar saying that the word ever means to make righteous. And here's what's interesting. Some of them go out of their way to point out, like they don't have to say in the case of every word, it doesn't mean this. All they have to do is show you what it means. Some lexical sources will say it does not mean this. Right. It does not mean to make righteous. And, and it's just it's it's horribly bad for the Roman yep. cause. And in fact, I could cite Roman Catholic scholars of the present day, one conservative Catholic scholar after another that confirms this this definition of the word. Right. Right. And, you know, Anthony, you're right. It, it is a declarative. It's a it's a it's a forensic uh, verdict type word. Um, so you and I were both we're both ministers of the gospel. And uh when you and I officiate at weddings uh, and you come to the conclusion of the wedding ceremony and you make the pronouncement of union where you, you I hereby declare you or I pronounce you to be husband and wife and so forth and so on. Uh, that is a legal pronouncement. It, it doesn't it doesn't make them any better. Uh, it doesn't uh, change their hearts, but it does change their legal status. So before the eyes of God and the eyes of the law of society, they're no longer, you know, separate a man, separate woman. They are now married. That is their legal status. And so the minister or the judge or, or uh, the clerk uh, of the court and so forth, when they make that legal pronouncement that they are now husband and wife, that is a legal declaration. But it does change their legal status so that positionally they are seen now as a married couple before the law and before the eyes of God. And so... And so in justification, uh, this verdict, this vindication, this pronouncement is something that God says to us in regeneration. When, when God raises us up from our, our sinful sleep and death and so forth, he pronounces us not guilty. Right. And uh, as I'm sure we'll get into, th this pronouncement is negatively not guilty and positively righteous right? right you are just before right. me and therefore have a title a right 
to certain benefits and privileges, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. and uh, also, you know, we're here just talking about this, the, the fact that it's a declaration and we're probably going to move on here. And I don't know all the, mm -hmm. the different uh, things that you're planning to bring up, but uh, the, the basis of this, uh, you know, it, it doesn't, the, the declaration itself has nothing to do with, with some sort of inward change. It's not right. that there isn't an inward change that takes place with respect to the believer, right? When we become believers, God does all sorts of wondrous things. Yeah. And uh, of course we're to strive for holiness. We're to grow in grace and knowledge. We're to uh, pursue holiness in the fear of God, all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But that's not what justification is. Justification no. is God's verdict. And the basis or the grounds of that has nothing to do with any of those inward things that are happening. It has nothing to do with us actually being righteous in ourselves. And I don't know that many people know this, but the Roman Catholic view is, is not just that, uh, like I think some Roman Catholics are under the impression because they've had to kind of tweak their own doctrine so that it looks more, it, it's too hard to defend Trent yeah. when you're looking at the Bible. So yeah. they, they've got to play a little bit of a shell and pee game. And I don't even know if they realize that they're, they're playing this game on themselves too. But I, I, I hear Roman Catholics sometimes who will talk about justification as though it is the remission of sins and God changing our character. But really what they mean by the remission of sins is different than what we mean. And when they talk about God, uh, basically the idea is this. They really believe that God eradicates sin from the soul in mm -hmm. justification yeah. he's pronouncing you righteous because you really are in yourselves righteous not just that you've been given a new heart and you are now beginning that process of pursuing righteousness and greater conformity to christ but you are at that moment really and truly sinless now concupiscence remains mm -hmm. so there's the ability still to sin but there there's no sinfulness about you uh, concupiscence itself is not sin, according to Rome. There's no sinfulness there. So when you do sin, what has to happen is you've got to go to confession and so forth to, to once again eradicate that sin so that you can be really and truly and actually just in the eyes of God. Mm -hmm. And that's just that's just not what the basis of justification is in the Bible. But yeah. I won't go further because I realize I'm going a little bit beyond the declarative issue that you brought up. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think that Rome, in many respects, confuses, I think, uh, justification with sanctification. I mean, sanctification is an ongoing work of the Holy Spirit whereby he conforms us to the image of Christ. And and you and I, we're still going through that sanctification process. Uh, but justification, when it's used, uh, especially by Paul, it's used as something that has already happened, uh, either in the aorist passive or in, in the perfect passive uh, uh, participle. So, so it seems to, to me that the scripture, the language of scripture conveys this justification as something that God has already done. And, and that yeah. sanctification is an ongoing work. And then of course, glorification is the final, is the, is the, the, the graduation. So, um, yeah, let, let's look at yeah. this passage. Sorry, did you want to add to that, uh, uh Anthony? J just one thing. Sure, uh, sure. it's, you mentioned it's something God has done. And yeah. it's something that God has done. This declarative statement is something that has been declared with respect to the wicked, right? So God is not declaring someone who is in himself just to be just right mm -hmm. in the eyes of the law and so yeah. forth, yeah. absolved of guilt and entitled to uh, eternal life. God is actually pronouncing somebody who really is just to be just. So this is why Rome accuses us of believing in a legal fiction. God is declaring something to be true of us that isn't actually the case. But mm -hmm. listen, I mean, and you, when I say listen, of course, better I should say re remember, because you know this, remember what Paul says in Romans 4. Paul says that uh, God uh, justified the wicked. Right? It's the wicked whom God justifies, right? not the righteous. Right. So Rome's gospel is just completely out of step with with what Paul declares. Yeah, I mean it's it's what Luther meant when he said uh, he said that the believer is, is, is justus e, e, e peccator similus peccator, meaning he is just justified, declared just, but he's a sinner. And in other words, he's a sinner that God has declared to be just. He's not like you said; he isn't a righteous person that God has declared to be just, but a, a sinner that God has declared to be just. And we're still struggling. Uh, while we are here in the world, in the flesh, we still struggle with that. 
Yeah. Right. Let's look at let's look at uh, the declarative sense of the word justification. Uh, so I, I've got the King James version and the ESV. So at the top there, this is where Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. He says, "I say to you, among those that are born of women, there's not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he." So after Jesus says that, what do the the people in verse 29 say? And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God, and that's the word edikaiosan, uh, which uh, in that particular uh, passage there is an active, uh, it's an aorist active indicative. And so the people justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. So this goes back to what you said earlier, Anthony, that even God is said to be justified. Now, certainly that doesn't mean that God is wicked and that God has to be uh, cleansed of some moral imperfection. But the ESV, notice how the ESV draws this out. Uh, when all the people heard this and the tax collectors too, they declared God just. So there's that declarative sense that we find in that Greek word there. I mean, the King James is being very literal there by using the word justified. The ESV br brings that declarative aspect out by translating it. They declared God just, having been baptized. Um, did you want to add to that? Yeah, it, it reminds me of a verse in Job that always comes to mind. And I hate that I say the word always sometimes when I don't really mean <laughs> always, <laughs> but it often comes to mind that, that when God finally appears to Job at the end of the book, he says to Job, would you condemn me to justify yourself? Right. So there you see a contrast between justification and condemnation. But but the idea is that Job, in saying that he shouldn't be enduring these certain things that are happening to him, he is, in effect, condemning God. He's saying God is not right in, in you know, all this stuff happening to him, you know. And, and so by by Job protesting his own innocence, he is, in effect, condemning God, saying yeah. God is wrong to, to, yeah. to do this. And and that's kind of what we're any of us are doing whenever we we are complaining about our circumstances right like we we can legitimately point out if somebody is doing if this is a result of somebody doing something that they don't have a right to do right we could say it's unjust for this person to be doing that but if we're just complaining and moaning and groaning as if in the providence of god this shouldn't have happened that that's an altogether different story right. god right. is perfectly just in all his dealings with us Right. And we deserve 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times worse than anything we get. Right. So right. whenever we complain, we are, in effect, saying that, that, that there, you know, God himself is unjust. Well, in, in this context, what, what's going on is when people submit to the baptism of John, which was a baptism of repentance, mm -hmm. they're, they're acknowledging God's purpose. They're saying, yes, we are sinners. We need to repent. We need to turn. We, we need to look to the one that God has said is coming and so forth. And, and by doing that, they are declaring that God is right. God is just. We're not. God right. is just. And, and so they're submitting to his purposes for them. And uh, so you could hopefully that just enhances how people are understanding yeah. the word there. Definitely. Definitely. Well, uh, here's some passages uh, where the apostle uh, points out that uh, that all have sinned. A familiar passage. We all fall short of, short of the glory of God are justified by his grace as a gift. So it's a gift. It's not something we merit or earn. And it's through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And so I think here uh, Paul is making a very clear distinction that this justification is, is in Christ, but it's, it's by faith. Uh, and it's not something that you achieve by any works of the law. Yeah. So, so there you have, first of all, the, the, the necessity for justification, right? You have all mm -hmm. have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why we need to be justified. And, and then it says, and we are justified, right, by his grace as a gift. So God wasn't obligated to provide this way of salvation or right. uh, to, you know, dispense it to us. And it's the, the meritorious grounds of it is the work of Christ, right? It's gracious on God's part. He didn't have to give Christ. He didn't have to give us to Christ. You know, none of this had to be, uh, you know, supplied to us. The, the, so the the moving cause is God's grace. The meritorious grounds is the redemption of Christ. The instrumental means here by which we receive it is faith. Right. And Paul even makes it clear that this is to the exclusion of works. Now, one thing I like to point out because it seems to me that 
you know, Roman Catholics still haven't gotten a handle on this. They always want to play games with what that phrase works of the law yeah. means. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I would say, don't miss the obvious, right? It's not just that Paul is saying it's not by that. He's telling you what it is by. Right. right? He's saying he's giving you the negative. He's giving you the positive. Paul would be negligent here if in giving you the positive, he left out the rest of it. You know, in other words, it's not Paul saying you're not justified by works of the law, but by faith and these other kinds of works that Roman right. Catholics. And, and by the way, half the works that Roman Catholics place so much stock in aren't even mentioned in the Bible, right? right. The, the, half that stuff isn't there at all to begin with. In fact, it, it's striking to me, it, just the arrogance of it. When you look at the Council of Trent's declarations on justification, it talks when it talks about meriting justification, meriting eternal life, it, it talks about doing so by means of, or not just by means of, but uh, by and on the grounds of obedience to the law of God and the laws of the Roman Catholic church. Right. So in addition to God's law, there are those laws of the Roman Catholic church that you must obey to be justified. Quite cut to the contrary. Paul here says it's on the grounds of the redemption that's in Christ. It's received through faith and not by works of the law. Right. So e even if you want to say that works of the law means something like only like circumcision or ceremonial observances, that doesn't scuttle the point because Paul says it is by faith. He doesn't just tell us what it's not by, right. but what it right. is by. It's by faith. And, and it's similar to, and I, I like to use this illustration. Anybody who's heard me has probably heard me use this illustration. If I say this to a Jehovah's Witness, Jesus is not a created angel like you believe, Michael the Archangel, mm -hmm. because Jesus is God right? God Almighty. Now, suppose somebody comes along and says, oh, so then Anthony's saying that Jesus is Satan's spirit brother, like the Mormons, right? And then what, it, now you would say that doesn't make any sense because Anthony, right. you know, uh, and then they would say, yeah, because all he was rejecting is that Jesus is Michael the archangel. Well, no, he rejected that Jesus is Michael the archangel because he is God Almighty. That right. same positive affirmation excludes or precludes the possibility that he's Satan's spirit brother. Well, it's right. the same idea here. When Paul says it is by faith, that's why it's not by works of the law. Exactly. So even if somebody wants to restrict works of the law to ceremonial ordinances, it doesn't matter what other thing you want to plug in there. The right. positive affirmation of how we are justified excludes and precludes any other way of justification that you want to uh, trump up. Right. Right. And I think Paul makes that point clear, as we're going to see very shortly. Uh, he 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 makes that very clear that he's not just talking about the works of the Mosaic law, but he's talking about works in general, any works. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll get that shortly. So Romans 5, 1, uh, one of my favorite texts in Scripture. Therefore, since we have been justified, so dikaiothentes, so there uh, we have an aorist passive participle. Uh, the aorist, of course, for those of you who don't know Greek grammar, the aorist has to do with something that uh, has occurred in the past. It's something that's already happened. Uh, and so this justification is being spoken of, and that's why it's translated in the ESV as, since we have been justified by faith, so there's that faith again, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice the, the legal intonations here, uh, 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 Anthony. The legal intonations is that because God has declared us to be uh, just uh, uh, in Christ, through faith in Christ, we now have peace with God. So, you know, the idea of a peace bond in law, we hear about peace bonds and so forth. So because of this uh, declaration by God that, that the sinner is, is declared to be not guilty by faith in Christ, he now has peace with God. And um, I know James White used to always say that, that Roman Catholics are, there, there is no peace with God because there is no certainty of salvation. Uh, they may commit a mortal sin and go straight to hell or venial sin and go to purgatory. Uh, and it's like a ceasefire. They're going through a ceasefire. And so there's a temporary ceasefire. But as you know, that ceasefire could end at any moment and God will take out his guns again on you. Um, and, and, and there's something to be said here about this shalom, this peace that we have with God. It, 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 is, it is so important for us to understand the connotations of that, that because God has forgiven us in Christ, declared us to be uh, just, um, we now have peace with him and this wholeness of relationship uh, with him. If you want to yeah, add to so, 
Yeah, one, one addition I'd make is is just to draw attention to the word therefore. Yeah, Paul's drawing a conclusion, which, you know, from what he started back in chapter three, right? Uh, up through, I'd say, midway in chapter three, Paul was talking about how the whole world is, is condemned before God, given its sinfulness in the face of God's uh, righteousness, the revelation of his righteousness, in the case of the Gentiles, through created nature. Uh, in the case of the, the Jew, in addition to nature, his own right, his, his own conscience and, and the creation, he had the, the published law of God. So that indicts the entire world, closes every man's mouth. Then Paul begins in Romans 3 to talk about how we're justified. And then in Romans 5, he's drawing this conclusion. Therefore, having been justified right. by faith, we have peace with God. And so w one one thing that might help bring this out, I think, is the way Paul begins, right? The first 17 verses of, of Romans 1 is the intro. Yeah. Verse 18 is where it begins that section where Paul yeah. begins to indict the world. He arranged the world before the bar of God's justice and says everyone's condemned. Well, what does Paul say there in Romans 1 18? He says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against right. all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So here you have this great conclusion. Therefore, since we have been justified, we have peace. Mm -hmm. with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, we have problem. peace. Th those yeah. of us who are otherwise surrounded and hounded by the revelation of God's wrath, both in nature and in scripture, we have peace with God, not through our own law keeping, but through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Right. So yeah. such a great promise, such a great promise. And then in verse nine of the same chapter, Romans five, nine, Paul goes on to say, since therefore, you know, whenever we see the word therefore, we should always ask why it's therefore. Uh, since, therefore, we have now been justified, so he reiterates that point, we've been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So that goes back to what you just said, Anthony, that in Romans 1.18, uh, Paul, it's interesting how, how Paul begins with wrath, and he begins with the law of God against sin. And then uh, he only mentions justification in chapter 4 of Romans, and then he deals with uh, the love of God in Romans 5, uh, most preachers today, it's all about love, right? It's all, they rarely deal with the law of God. They de rarely deal with God's wrath and uh, his judgment, uh, eternal damnation. They don't talk about that. And yet in Paul's Magna Carta of Romans, he begins with the wrath of God. And then he, the, he only mentions the love of God in terms of redemption in chapter 5, verse 5, and moves on from there. So I, I think it just it ties into what you just said, Anthony, that that beautiful promise that we are saved from that wrath of Romans 118 because of the blood of Christ and and because of God's declarative uh, uh, declaration that we are just in his sight yeah and and uh that little word now I don't yeah. know if your next next slide has Romans 8 on it but no I don't I but uh, yeah go ahead Romans 8 1 is so important yeah so these two verses really you know remind one of the other you know so yeah. romans 8 1 says there therefore there is now no condemnation right. for those who are in christ jesus now right. the, the roman catholics will also often say things like yeah now there's not but if you <laughs> sin and so forth well then all bets are off right now you could possibly be on your way to hell yeah. the, the, this, this misses the force of this in pauline thinking and pauline eschatology biblical yeah. theology generally yeah. Absolutely. What, what scholars observe is that Scripture speaks in terms of two ages, this age and the age to come, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the age to come is the age uh, of the spirit, the age uh, where we partake of immortality and yep. all, all these things. So, in fact, I've been doing a study on uh, Genesis 1, and it's interesting to look at certain rabbinic comments uh, and how they all how they already, when they're looking at Genesis 1, are thinking about the age to come. Uh, and I, I don't want to get off on a whole excursus here, but sure. that was the, the expectation of every Jewish person. They were looking forward to the age to come. And what Paul does is startling because, again, this is uh, this is just well recognized and, and we could spend a whole, you know, several sessions on this. But what Paul observes is that in Christ, the we are already partakers of the age to come. Absolutely. Right. There are certain things that still remain to be consummated. Right. We we don't yet participate in the in in all aspects of what is already ours in Christ. Right. But we do right now have certain 
benefits that belong to that future age to the believer in Christ who will who will be there with him. So, for right. example, the age to come is the you know the age of life where we're, we're going to reign with him forever. But right now, believers have eternal life. That's right. why Scripture can sometimes speak of eternal life as something we're looking forward to. And mm -hmm. then at the same time, also speak of us having eternal life. Like, like John will often say things like, whoever believes in the Son has eternal right. life and will not enter into judgment. Right. right? So, so John is, like Paul, making this observation that right now we participate in those future realities. They're already yeah. ours. Absolutely. And so that's, that's the force of this now here. Paul's saying there, there is a coming judgment. There's a day when all people are going to stand before God. But because the believer is in Christ, that judgment for the believer has the, the verdict of it has already taken place. Right. We have already been justified in Christ. Yeah. Right now we are justified. So it's not this idea like, oh, you are right now at uh, you know, 859 or whatever time it is, but you might not be at 901. Right? That's yeah. not at all what Paul is getting at. No. How would you ever get such a uh, such an exhilarating statement like 5-1 where it yeah. says, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. If yeah. Paul was only saying at this very second, but maybe not the next second, yeah. that's, that's, that's just not what Paul is. Right? Yeah, that's, that's the analogy of the ceasefire, right? That there's a temporary yeah. ceasefire, but the guns can start shooting again. So there is no permanent peace at all. And so there's always this anxiety. Yeah, you know, and I like what you said there, Anthony, that, I mean, even, even scholars who study the, the, the gospel of John, you know, there was a, a big thing about John gives us a realized eschatology. And that's because this language, you know, and you're right, the Jews divided everything into uh, um, uh, olam hazeh, which means this world, and olam haba, the world to come. And so in John's gospel, you have this idea of this eternal life is now. You've passed from death to life. You, you will not enter into judgment. And that even now we're spoken of as being uh, raised from spiritual death. We are seated with him in the heavenly places. Positionally, we are seated with Christ. Um, and so you've got this tension of the sometimes called the now and the not yet. That yes, now we are in Christ. We are alive. Uh, but we still have not, we still need the bodily resurrection, you know, the, the change from mortal to immortal and so forth and so on. So, but but this whole thrust that Paul is talking about that you mentioned, Anthony, in Romans 5 and then 8, etc., you know, where he says, now there is no, no condemnation. Um, you know, the Roman Catholic uh, interpretation is basically uh, eradicated when you look at the golden chain of redemption near the end of Romans 8, Paul says, look, those whom God has called, he has predestined. And those whom he has predestined, he has justified. And those whom he has just, uh, justified, he says he has glorified. So the glorification is something that comes at the end, but Paul speaks of it as already a done deal. It's already done because we are secure in Christ. God's salvation is sure. That it's not this, oh, uh, you know, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, you know, the daisy Christianity. But that what we are being told there is that that chain is unbreakable. That golden chain of redemption, there are no missing links. It is connected all together. And so those whom God has called, those are the ones who ultimately are going to be just uh, glorified as well. So um, that's why we can have peace with God. Right? That's yeah, why yeah. God, it's a wonderful thing. It's a marvelous thing. It's amazing. In, in right? fact, I, I don't. There was something you said earlier that was making me think of this, and maybe this—it's because you were telling us where we're going. But so hopefully, I'm not just jumping the gun here. But this, this is wondrously important when it comes to something like even like obedience. You know, obedience isn't obedience if it proceeds on the assumption that it uh, this is being done as the meritorious grounds of right. salvation, right? If, if we're doing something thinking that by it, we are obligating God or even that it's, you know, cause some Roman Catholics will try and make specious distinctions, you know, uh, like Roberts and Genesis likes to distinguish between uh, works of debt and works of grace so that he'll say, God graciously agrees to give us eternal life on the basis of our works. So it's still really meritorious, but yeah. it's, yeah, you know, God is looking and saying, okay, I'm willing to accept this or something like, he's just lowering the standards, right? Yeah. But uh, 
no, the, the, the good works of the believer proceed wholly from the fact that Christ has saved us. I mean, it's kind of right. like if somebody's like if I, I use this analogy a lot, too, where I talk about if you if I describe for you a ship and there are all these people on the ship and everybody has a part to play to make the ship function. And each person is doing his part and working together. So, you know, one person is cleaning the deck. One person is uh, raising the mass. Uh, one person is steering, you know, e each person doing, you know, somebody's cooking. And let's say there's, there's some moment where one guy is faltering. So the other guy comes along and, and helps him, you know, and, yep. and uh, maybe he's not feeling well that day. So other people are taking up some of the slack. All this looks beautiful. We might think these guys are all doing great works and everything. But now if I add this detail to it, everything changes. Yep. Suppose you look now at the flag that's being flown by this ship and it's a skull and crossbones. <laughs> now, you know, it's a pirate ship and they're at war with, they're at odds with, enmity with the government, uh, you know, whose shores they're, you know, uh, uh, traveling along. Sure. And the government is not looking at those people on the ship saying, oh, what wonderful good works. Look at how well each of them works together. You know, everything they're doing is viewed as the actions of people who are legally in rebellion against them. Right. So right. what we're saying is in justification, God has restored our legal status with him. We are we are right with him. Only right. then do our, our works. Uh, are they of any moment? Right. Uh, because, right. again, not not just because the person now is accepted, which is necessary, but also because the 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 motive of those works is different. It's now no longer being done with a view of meriting God's favor or uh, secure, you know, in any way giving yeah. us grounds for both. And it, all that's removed. It's all done out of <coughs> love and gratitude and so forth for the God who made us, saved us, exactly, and, and so on. So, so we we don't do good work. The old the old adage goes. We don't do good works to be saved. We do good works because we are saved. In other words, it's the fruit of, of our of our faith that God has given to us. Yeah. And, and isn't that the order all throughout Scripture? You know, I, I love the preface of the Ten Commandments, which I think a lot of Christians move past, you know. But it, the preface says, I am the Lord your God who delivered you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Therefore... Have no other gods besides me. Yeah. God is saying, I redeemed you from Egypt. Now, exactly. here's how you ought to live as my redeemed exactly. people. Exactly. Right? That's that's the order. Exactly. And it's the order of the Pauline epistles. He yep. moves from indicative to imperative. This is what Christ has done for you. This is what is true of you by virtue of being in Christ. Now, you should live this way in light of that. Exactly. So the people at the base of Sinai, we need to understand this, that these were a this was a redeemed nation. This was a corporate nation that was redeemed by God's grace out of Egypt. He did everything for them. He opened the sea for them. He, he rained down the plagues on Egypt and so forth. And so it's interesting that the law is given, given to a people that have already been at least physically, nationally redeemed uh, out of bondage. And then God gives them the law. It doesn't. He doesn't give them the law and say, okay, guys. Awesome job. I'll give you an A plus, a B, a C, etc. So it, it is it is to a redeemed nation that God gives his law. And so, uh, like you said, that it work works follow faith. It doesn't precede faith, but it follows faith. Yeah. yeah. And, and of course, that redemption was a temporal deliverance. Yes. And uh the the obedience that should have followed uh but didn't in the case of Israel yeah. was evidence of their lack of faith, right? Correct. In fact, that's the point that Hebrews makes that that these people didn't have faith and that's why their lives didn't reflect right reflect it. Um right. so yeah, true faith is what uh unites us to Christ and and because of that we're justified and that issues forth in obedience but isn't the ground of our salvation. Right. So yeah. Right. And that's what I think Paul, uh, uh, he will later say, but here in, in Romans 4, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due, obviously. So when we go to our jobs, uh, we're not doing it as a gift. We're, we're working to earn our due. Uh, as to the one who does not work, notice uh, here Paul distinguishes between uh, work and, and, and faith, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, going back to what you said about just justifying the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. 
And then he goes to Psalm 32, he quotes David, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God uh, counts righteousness apart from works. And then there's the quote from Psalm 32, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not account his sin or the Lord will not impute sin, the King James, I believe, says. So uh, here it's very obvious, it's very clear that Paul is talking about the blessed man is the one that God does not reckon sin, does not impute sin to that person, and that God is the one who justifies the ungodly. Yeah, and uh, so one thing here, the word gift is literally grace, mm -hmm. right? The one who works his wages are not counted as grace. Of course, Paul will say later in Romans 11, if it is by works and it's no longer by grace, right? Right, right? Otherwise, grace wouldn't be grace. So with respect to justification, works and grace are antithetical. Right. Right. Not that not that works are contrary to the life no. of faith, no. but that in the matter of justifying man before God, these two things don't mix. Right. So justification is a gift. It's gracious. And that precludes, it rules out that it could possibly be by works. And so somebody... Uh, I, I hear this, the number of errors people can make astound me. And, you know, I, uh, if I didn't hear some of them, I would never even think of them. They're, they're just so so outlandish, <laughs> some of them. But, but you know, the, the human mind is so, you know, Calvin said the human mind's like an idol factory. We yeah. churn out idols all the time. Yeah. But it's also an idol factory in this sense that we churn out ways of smuggling in our own righteousness any way we can. So you'll hear some people twist what Paul is getting at here and say, Oh, so faith itself is the righteous thing that God accepts from us and on the grounds of which he justifies us. That's not what Paul is saying here. No. Faith is not being treated as some meritorious ground. It's an, it's an instrument through which we receive the righteousness of Christ. But the, the, uh, Paul makes this especially clear later in Romans 4, I believe it's verse 19, where Paul says, uh, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace. In other words, faith preserves the gracious character of this justification. Right. Any other means would render it by works, right? Faith is not a work, as some people right. want to allege. That's, that's no. what people are after here. Faith no, it, is the work. Yeah, I mean, in yeah. Philippians, Paul says it has been given unto you to believe. So there's a divine yeah. passive. Paul uses the divine passive there that it has been given unto you to believe. And so in that respect, faith would also be a gift from God. Yeah. So faith is a gift and it's an instrument through which we receive the righteousness of right. Christ. It's not a work in place of the works that we didn't do. Right. It's not like God is saying, do this work instead and I'll accept that. Right. It's not a work from God's perspective. It's a gift and it's merely an instrument through which we receive something it's not something that we're doing in order to provide a meritorious grounds for salvation. Right. Faith right. unites us to Christ, who's the basis of our justification. Right. And so then, you know, when Paul says, uh, and I drew attention to this earlier, but I'll, we'll underscore it now. But he says, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. So it's the ungodly whom God is justifying, not right. those who have been inwardly made righteous, but those who are not righteous are being justified. Why? Because the basis of the declaration is not our righteousness, it's Christ. Right. right? We're, the faith here is obviously in Christ uh, throughout Romans. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, then he gives he gives the example. I mean, the, the, the example here, first of all, you have four, four through eight. But in the context, it was talking about Abraham. Yeah, in verse and one. It goes on. It goes on to talk about David. And note the language. I think people miss some of what's going on here because you have you have some people denying that justification involves the imputation of Christ's righteousness. They they want to say it just involves the the removal of our guilt or sin. Yeah. But not also this positive aspect of Christ's righteousness being imputed to us. But David doesn't just speak of uh, our sins being forgiven. He says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Right. What is that which covers them? Right. Mm -hmm. So God isn't counting our sins against us. They are removed from us. But there's this additional aspect of them being covered. 
And what is that covering but the righteousness of Christ? The right. righteousness that Paul here speaks of being counted to us or reckoned or credited to us. And, you know, it makes it, you, you got to love and, and people uh, should read these passages with this in mind in, in Isaiah. Over yeah. and over again, yeah. Isaiah talks about God clothing his people with garments of salvation and a robe of righteousness. What is he right. talking about? Right. And why do we have to be clothed? Right. Yeah. If it's, if it's, and the whole picture there, by the way, isn't one of inward transformation. It's it's all a picture of this external forensic, yeah. which is not to say that's all God does in salvation. Right. But that is what justification is. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and Isaiah, Isaiah also speaks about how all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags uh, in his nostrils. And so even our deeds that we deem to be righteous God looks at them and he says, they stink, literally. I mean, the, the Hebrew word is very graphic. It's literally, it's menstrual rags. But the idea, and the King James says uh, uh, that they are like filthy rags before God. But this, this idea of clothing, you go right back to Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned against God and they ran and hid and they, they covered themselves with these fig leaves. And it says that God killed, God took the, the hide of two animals and he himself clothed them. And so that clothing begins right in Genesis in the Garden of Eden after the fall. And it's God who takes the initiative to clothe them. I mean, they try to cover their nakedness with their own works, you know, the, the fig leaves. They were still naked in the eyes of God. And it took God himself to clothe them in his righteousness. And so that language, as you rightly pointed out, Anthony, is picked up by Isaiah. And, and of course, in the New Testament, it becomes a very, a very powerful metaphor for our justification that we've been covered, we've been clothed. It's like the prodigal son. The guy comes back after spending all his father's uh, wealth and, and so forth. He's you know he, he's feeding pigs, which in, in a Jewish context is a very demeaning thing. He comes back stinking like pigs and so forth. And his father puts on a garment, a ring on his finger. He puts on a robe on him. And you've got this beautiful picture there of, 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 of an unworthy son who's rebelled against his father. And the father takes it upon himself to treat him like royalty and give him a king's feast. So, uh, again, it's, it's back to God's amazing grace. It's back to his grace. Yeah, yeah. And so, in fact, uh, the Garden of Eden and the prodigal son story, you have in both cases a sacrifice and the idea of clothing. Right. So Adam and Eve are clothed in the garments of an animal, which presupposes the animal's death. Right. And this is the backdrop to the Cain and Abel story where Cain apparently isn't getting the picture that this is the way to approach God. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so but but you have the, the, the slaying of an animal and then being clothed in its skins. And then the prodigal son, the, the father, when the son comes, he says, kill the fattened calf. Right. right. So there's this this killing that takes place and he's clothed in in a. Uh, uh, robe. So that, that sort of thing happens all throughout the Old Testament. And I think once people hear something like this, they, 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 their ears might perk up more when they, you know, think, for example, of the, another image would be like when Ruth, uh, when, when Boaz throws his garment over her, right? Boaz is the kinsman redeemer, right? right? And this, this covering is a way of saying that her shame has been covered, right? Yeah. I mean, all through the New or Old Testament, you have this imagery being set forth. And uh, so th this isn't like, you know, a incidental thing, like scripture here and there comes around yeah. to saying something about, it's all over the place. It's a thread. It's a thread. That yeah. Runs right from the beginning. Another passage, of course, the famous passage of the Pharisee and the, the, the tax collector going into the temple, you know, and the Pharisee, gets up and he tells God what a wonderful person he is, how many converts he did. He pulled a Rick Warren, you know, he, he talked about his accomplishments uh, before God. And, and and the Greek literally says he prayed to himself. So it was like yeah. he was praying yeah. to himself, just showing off. And then it says, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the Lord Jesus said, I tell you, this man, this publican, this tax collector went down to his house justified. The, the word there is dedi kaimenos, which is uh, the perfect passive participle there, uh, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So here you have this tax collector who was like the bottom of the, of the bottom, the scum of the earth in Jewish eyes. And this man wouldn't even lift his eyes up to heaven, and he cried out to God for mercy. 
unlike the Pharisee who bloated about his, his reputation. And Jesus says that this man, this tax collector, went home justified. And what did he do? Did he have anything to offer to God, any meritorious works? He just threw himself at the mercy of God. And the Lord Jesus said he was justified, not the Pharisee, not the guy who pointed to his works, his meritorious works. It was this despicable sinner who cried out for mercy and threw himself at the mercy of the court, of God's court. Yeah, and, and notice also this. So the, the, the Roman Catholic will say that what was wrong with the Pharisee and by, you know, what, what Catholics are saying by contrast is that, yeah. you know, the good, the good works that we do are gracious, right? God graciously enables us to do uh -huh. this. He graciously enables us to merit salvation, right? It's just a way of smuggling yeah. in works righteousness through the back door, yeah. right? Yeah, they absolutely. look like they're tipping their hat to grace. It reminds me of the, I don't know if you've seen in, in uh, Temple Square in Salt Lake City, I don't know if you've ever been there, but no, the, the Mormon, it, it's really funny. So Temple Square is where their main temple is, the, yeah. the Mormon temple. Yeah, yeah. And they had, they, you know, they built parts of it at different times. Now it's this big city, but, it, you know, not everything was there at the same time. So they, yeah. at one point, they built this statue of um, the the second, the, the guy after Joseph. Brigham Young. Brigham Young. Brigham Young. Yeah. Brigham Young. Brigham Old. Bring, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> So Brigham Young, they build a statue of Brigham Young, and then the, the the temple is like situated behind him. Yeah. Well, eventually they built a bank across the street so that the way it's it looks is Brigham Young has got his he's like he's like this with his hand out and his rump over here. Yeah. He's got his butt towards the church and his hand towards the bank, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's that's kind of the you know the Roman Catholic thing is like they're you know. In, on the one hand, they're they're you know they think they're getting out of this objectionable view of justification on the basis of your own righteousness by saying, well, the righteousness is something we do by grace. Right. But what do we see in the case of the Pharisee? The Pharisee says, "I thank you, God, that I'm not like he." And then he lists all these things that he's done. So the Pharisee is there's a one to one correspondence between the Pharisee and the Roman Catholic. The Pharisee didn't think he was doing these good works on his own gusto. Nope. God helped him do the works. He was tipping his hat to grace, but at the same time saying, I made great use of grace. I'm the one who, you know, all this stuff and so forth. And by the way, Jesus starts the parable by saying uh, that, uh, you know, certain people sought to justify themselves. Right. Like he told this parable against certain people. There, there's two different ways to render that. It's just, you can either render it as he told the parable to certain people who sought to justify themselves, right. or he told the parable against them. Either one is a legitimate translation. Yeah. But the fact is that's the context. The context is talking about justification and certain people thought it was on the basis of their own efforts, even efforts done by grace. Jesus rejects that. And the contrast that he provides here is that of a man who doesn't put forward any work. He doesn't mention anything that he has done, not even by grace. Yeah. Right. He just says, I, you know, be merciful to me, a sinner. But I have yeah. nothing else to, to say, you know, be merciful. And then, and, and then later, Luke's going to introduce another figure, uh, the thief on the cross, uh, who throws himself at the mercy of Jesus. Uh, he has nothing to show for, no meritorious works. I mean, my heavens, he was he couldn't even get baptized. He wasn't even baptized. Uh, and yet, uh, he he recognizes he's a sinner. Baptism of desire. <laughs> yeah, invincible ignorance. But uh, he he recognizes his need for a savior. He knows he's a sinner. He knows Jesus is the messianic king because he tells him to remember him when he comes in his kingdom. And so, and the Lord Jesus doesn't say to him, you know, you'll be you'll you'll be in paradise today. You'll be in. He says you'll be with me in paradise. This relationship that transcends death, that we continue to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ even after our physical death. And so so, so beautifully, Luke mentions the tax collector. He later mentions the thief uh, on the cross who, who simply trusts Christ for salvation without anything to show for. He's on his deathbed, so to speak. He has nothing to show for, and the Lord Jesus promises him uh, paradise that very same day. Yeah, and that uh, now you've you've brought up just uh, several examples in Luke. You could have brought up others, 
yep. but there, there's something additional to be to be brought out here is that yep. we've seen several examples. The reason this is significant is because when you point to something like the thief on the cross, the inevitable response is, oh, that's an exception to the rule, <laughs> right? Yeah, the, the thief on the cross is not being presented as an exception in Luke's gospel. It's just the climactic example exactly. of what Luke has been showing all along, right? Exactly. That people are being saved, justified by faith. And uh, so the thief is not the example of the extreme case. It's no. again, it's just like it's like Luke saying, here's one final example of this I'm going to show you. And uh, really, when you think about it, I, I, I talked about how the final judgment, in a sense, has been ushered into uh, this age in, in the person of Christ, and those that are in Christ participate in the benefits of that. I, I, I When you look at Luke, and, and a lot of the fathers did this, and, and I think that's legitimate, but remember how Jesus spoke of the final judgment in Matthew 25? Yeah. He mentioned coming, being seated on his glorious throne, and then all nations being gathered before him and him uh, he would separate the one from the other and yep. put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Yep. Well, it, it's very interesting to me that in Matthew's gospel, when he does that, when he talks, it, it's like there's this seamless movement from Jesus talking about coming and being seated on his glorious throne. And then immediately in the next chapter, you see Jesus nailed to a cross. Yeah. And it's almost like Matthew is presenting the cross as Christ's throne. Yeah. Right. And 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 there's numerous other ways to bring this out, but I, I I it's pretty solid that there's all this language that suggests the cross is is being pictured as a throne. No doubt. And no so doubt about it. That yeah. that makes it all the more interesting when in Luke's gospel you have one person on Christ's right, one person on Christ's left. One yeah. is saved, one is lost, right? One yeah. goes to perdition. And so in, in effect, what you have is here's the judgment. Christ is there seated on his throne. Yeah. And, and what's the basis of the verdict? This man believes in Jesus, confesses him, and is promised paradise. This other man continues to blaspheme and reject Christ and yep. so forth. So yep. this is not an exception if, nope. if, if what I just described, number one, Luke has given several examples prior to this of justification, uh, not on the basis of works, but through faith. Right. And here, as the climactic example, it's like a picture of the final judgment we're not dealing with an exception here. We're, we're right. dealing with, you know, these are, these are examples. Luke's saying, look at this, you know, th exactly this is the, right. the same gospel that's held out to you. And, and by the way, I mean, my thought would be this too, like, uh, you know, our, it, it, it's almost like it's better off to be a thief. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, did the gospel get worse after the thief on the cross? Yeah. I mean, now all of a sudden there's all these other conditions, yeah. you know, for him, it was this way. You know, uh, much better to be a thief on a cross, I guess, than uh, you yeah. know, the, the average believer after him. I don't know. Right, right. Well, you know, a couple of things as well, uh, Anthony, that backs up that the cross is the throne is, um, well, for one thing, Christ is at the center. The center is the place of honor. At the transfiguration, he's at the center. And Moses and Elijah, he's flanked by Moses and Elijah. At the cross, he's in the center. There's two thieves, one on his right, one on his left. But let's not forget as well, there's the crown of thorns. So Christ bears the crown on his head. And even though it was a mocking, it was a, the, the thorns represent the fall, the curse of Eden. He takes the curse on his head, meaning mm -hmm. that, of course, the last Adam, he's going to restore the heavens and the earth. He will bring about the new heaven and the new earth and so forth. You know, it's like that, you know, the Christmas hymn, Joy to the World, that he removes the, the curse as far, you know, as far as the curse is found, he removes it. And, and so Christ takes the, the crown of thorns on his head. They put a, 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 a purple robe on him, a, a kingly robe, obviously, to, to mock him as a king. They give him a reed. And so the Romans, you know, Mark 15 says that the Romans would are bowing before him, the soldiers, and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And here's the irony. The irony is that they are actually worshiping the king. He is the king of Israel. He is the king of the Jews. They're actually worshiping him, even though they're mocking in, in, in that context. The irony is that Israel did not recognize and worship her king, but these pagan Gentiles are worshiping the king. Uh, and then, of course, in John's gospel, uh, you've got the burial of Jesus. And it's not just Joseph, and the, as you see in the synoptics, it's Joseph and Nicodemus in John 20 that come and give Jesus that burial. And if you if you look at the amount of spices that they used, I mean, think about this, um, uh, Anthony, that the, the amount of spices used in the burial of Jesus in John 20, 
is the type of spices used for a king's funeral. It's like an exuberant amount, a very expensive amount. But the idea there is that the king, this is the king. And in John's gospel, what does the Lord Jesus do? He compares his death as his glorification. Now has the time come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He's going to be lifted up. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. So you're you're absolutely on target, uh, Anthony, that the crucifixion of Christ and his his crown of thorns, the raiment, the, the, the reed that he holds in his hands, all of these are all regal connotations. Yeah, and yeah. the titulus uh, above the cross. Yeah. Jesus, the Nazarene, king of the yeah. Jews. King of the Jews. Um, you know, one thing that I said that of him as well. Yeah. Yeah. One thing uh, that's interesting about that for whatever it's worth to people that are perhaps interested in this to chase it down, Matthew uh, and Mark and Luke and, and so forth, they, they mentioned that there was this titulus with this yep. description, but then yep. we also learn that it was in several different language yep. languages, which in part would account for why there's some variation in the wordings between the Gospels. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but if you render in Hebrew the, the phrase Jesus, the Nazarene and King of the Jews, it's yes. interesting it forms an acrostic. I don't know if you ever yeah. noticed it, but it, it uh, it's uh, Yeshua, so Yod, yeah. Ha Natsiri, so yeah. the Nazarene, the Nazarene, yeah, the Melech, so yeah. the, the 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 king, uh, Vait, right? But it, yeah. but it, it's you know you have the uh, the Melech for and yeah. right and king yeah. of the Jews, uh, and the phrase Jews Yehuda, uh, yeah, Yehudim, uh, or ha, ha ya, Ha Yehuda or Ha, ha Yehudim. Yeah. Yehudim. So yeah. it it ends up being Yod He Vav He, yeah, which is the tetragrammaton. The so the over Lord. the cross you have the divine name. Uh, the high priest, when he would enter into the holy of holies, used to have the the placard over his head, yeah. "Holy to the Lord," and so yeah. forth. I mean, there's all this stuff going on, and yeah, the cross is being presented this way, and so this is not an exception. This is a picture of how people are saved. It's, it, you know, uh, I, I, but I often, I, I marvel when people want to make exceptions out of what ends up really being the rule, like, you know, and yeah. the rule in this case, in Luke's gospel is salvation through faith in Christ and apart from works. Right. Right. Well, look at this one, Anthony, of course, here, Paul makes it very clear. Uh, we're justified not by works of the law. Uh, and, and that it's again, through faith in Christ, we, uh, so we believed in Christ Jesus in order. Why have we believed in Jesus Christ? There's a purpose clause there. In order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. And so works plays no part in justification. I'm not saying works is not important. It is a part of our Christian walk. Uh, we've been created unto good works but it is not the means by which we are justified before God. I think it's crystal clear. Yeah, and again, just to remind people, Paul states this negatively and positively. Actually, what's interesting in, in 2.16, uh, Paul says it three times positively, three times negatively, mm -hmm. right? So he says, uh, not justified by works uh, at the start of the verse, and mm -hmm. then he says, uh, not by works of the law. Mm -hmm. And then he says, uh, no, uh, by works of the law, no one will be justified. So right. three times he negates justification yeah. by works. And three times he states positively that it is by faith or through believing. Right. right? He right. says, uh, through faith in Christ Jesus. Then he says, we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith. So right. how, how much clearer can it possibly get? Yeah. And most scholars would point out that 216 is really the theme verse of Galatians. This is what Paul Definitely. has been working up to in the first two chapters and is now going to launch into a full-scale defense of following 216. Yeah. So this is the heart of, of what Paul's contending for in, in Galatians. And th this contrast, I mean, again, the idea that you could reduce this to Paul just saying, you're not justified by keeping ceremonial ordinances. Right. Yes, that's included, of course. Of course it's included because Paul says it's by faith. So of course it's not by ceremonial ordinances, but by the same token, it's not by any kind of works. 
right? right? It, 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 if it is by faith, and that's the reason it's not by works, then it doesn't matter what kind of works you want to talk about. Yeah. You know, any new work that Rome dreams up around the corner, you know, the Pope could put on his pointy hat and say, hey, there's a new work required for justification. Everybody has to put on their left shoe first and then their right shoe. You yeah. know, I mean, it doesn't matter what comes down the, the papal pike or yeah. any any group of, that wants to advocate works righteousness. Right. It is not by that work or any work. It is because yeah. it is, you know, by faith. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's oil and water. You can't mix the two. Oil and water are always distinct. And so, and so, it, and, and Peter, uh, Peter is the one who's getting this, this tongue lashing by Paul. I mean, Paul is addressing these words to Peter that, that he is actually rebuking here. And then in Galatians 5, uh, he says, you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. I mean, Paul is, he's just, that guy is just, he is going through to great extent here, great pains to try to tell us that this has nothing, justification has nothing to do with works at all. Yeah, and and you just reminded me of something. It's it's, and I'm sure you've noted the irony that the the place where Paul gives us the most systematic presentation, positive presentation yeah. of justification by faith, is the epistle to the Romans. Yeah, right. So it's it's one of the greatest ironies that it, the Roman Church officially anathematized that eventually in its history. Yeah, and it's ironic that the 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 most polemical treatment of this subject where Paul's going after some form of denial or departure from it is Galatians, where he takes issue with Peter, who's allegedly the first Pope. Yeah. yeah. Right? Now, now I would say that, that Peter does not actually deny the truth that we're justified by faith. That's not what Paul is getting at. What Paul is upbraiding Peter for is acting out of accord with that by shrinking right. back from the Gentiles and only right. associating with the Jews, giving credence to this whole error so right. Peter is by his actions acting out of accord with the gospel. Right. Uh, but in any case, it's still Peter, right? And, right? and so Paul's saying, look, Peter, you know as well as I do. In fact, uh, the verse 15 of Galatians 2, when Paul says uh, we are Jews and not sinners from among the Gentiles, he's not saying we're not sinners in the sense of yeah. transgressors of God's law. He's talking about that categorical distinction that Jews made between themselves and the Gentiles. We're God's yeah. nation. They're sinners, right? They don't have God's law. Right, right. Paul, Paul when Paul says we we are uh, uh, Jews and not sinners, you know, and then he says, nevertheless, we know that a person is not justified by works. When he says we, he's talking about himself and Peter. Right, right. right. So he's saying, we know this. Me and Peter right. know this, right? Yeah. And, and so that's why it was so blameworthy what Peter was doing. You know, how yeah. does Peter, who knows this full well, look down his nose at Gentiles, knowing that he's no better off before God than they are and on no other grounds than they are, right? It's the same gospel for Jew and Gentile. Exactly, exactly. And we know from Acts 15 that even Peter recognized that it's it's not by the law, but by through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. And I think it's Acts 15, 11. Uh, so in Romans 11, 5 to 6, we mentioned this earlier, uh, Anthony, so there the Apostle Paul is talking about this, this remnant that is chosen by grace. Uh, but if it is by grace, then it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. And so, and in the majority text, it, it goes on to say, and if it is by works, then it's not by grace. But that's in the majority text. So if we if we were to just look at this statement here by Paul, uh, it's very clear that Paul is basically saying, look, if it is on the basis of grace, Grace excludes works, but if, but again, vice versa, if it's on the basis of works, then that would uh, that would exclude grace. And so, it's very clear that grace and works are not totally divorced from each other, but they are distinct. They are importantly distinct. Uh, works flows out of our faith, but Paul is basically saying here: Look, if it is on the basis of grace, it's not about works here. God's God's election of His people is not on the basis of works. It has to be by grace. And, and, and this is the same sort of thing that you see Paul saying elsewhere, like with respect to Christ. You know, if if he says, if you get circumcised, Christ is of no value to you. A lot of right. people think that as long as we're professing faith in Christ and believing what he did, and then somebody comes along and adds these things, well, okay, that's a mistake. Maybe, maybe they'll go that far and say it's a mistake. Maybe they'll say, no, it's the truth and you have to do this. 
Paul doesn't allow for these these uh, syncretizing you know uh, attempts. It's Christ or nothing, right? You don't get Christ right. and this. It's right. it's Christ alone. That's where we get the sola. It's Christ alone. It's not Christ plus. Those aren't the options, right? right? You right. either have Christ and, and he's the way or it's something else. Right. Jesus won't be compromised with anything. And, right. and here is a perfect example of where we get the notion of sola gratia. Right? Right. We say grace alone because Paul's not allowing for grace and works here. Mm -hmm. Right. Again, not in the sense that Paul doesn't think that believers, as you said, will will do good works. We're talking about the grounds of God's acceptance, the grounds of God's election, the grounds of God's saving activity, all these sorts of that's what Paul is is excluding from the equation. Right. And and by the way, this is where uh this is that great section where Paul uh breaks forth in a doxology at the end, yes. right? He, yes. he he starts off in Romans nine. And then he, he concludes at the end of Romans 11 by saying, uh, uh, you know, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments mm -hmm. and his ways of uh, past finding out. And he says, for who has first given to the Lord that it might be repaid to him. Right. And then he says, for of him and through him and to him are all things to him belongs the glory forever and ever. Right. Right. So it's the very nature of God that precludes this sort of thing. That's that's why it's it's so scandalous in my mind, not just because it's false that that we could be justified by works, but because it strikes at the, the, the very truth that we confess as Christian theists. Right. The, the kind of God he is rules out that he, he could possibly be our debtors. It's right. just not even a possibility. It has to be right. by grace. Yes, yes, because Paul has already established in, in, in Romans 3 and, and even Romans 7 that, I mean, if we could keep the law perfectly and obey the law perfectly, God could declare us just if we could keep it. But Paul's point is man cannot keep the law of God. The law, as he pointed out, brings the knowledge of sin. The law points us to Christ. I think it was Spurgeon who said, that it's the law that drives us to the cross of Christ. And so when we look at the law of God, there is only one person we know, Anthony, who kept the, the law of God perfectly, who lived a perfect righteous life, who kept God's law without fault, and he kept it on our behalf. In other words, as our great substitute, our federal head, his perfect life, his perfect obedience is imputed to our account. So it's not just the death of Christ, his 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 burial, his resurrection. All of that is ours in him. We've died with him. We've been buried with him. We rise with him. We ascended with him. But his perfect life is, is imputed to us as well. In other words, Christ's perfect obedience to the law of God, he is the only one who could keep that law. We couldn't keep it. And he kept it perfectly. And so his righteousness becomes ours through imputation by faith in him. Yeah. Uh, you know, the other day I was uh, we, we, looking at Isaiah 53. I might, uh, and I, I don't think I've mentioned this to you. It only yeah. recently came up, but I might be doing a debate with Shadid Lewis on oh, yeah. the suffering servant. Is Jesus the suffering yeah, he, servant? Yeah, he disappeared for quite a while. So I guess he's uh, he's back. Yeah, he, he mentioned to George that he's interested in getting back into debating. Okay. And uh, so that's that's great. And I so I was trying to think of a topic, you know, what would I like to debate? And I was put out by the fact that I noticed Shabir Ali and Yusuf Ismail are going to yeah. be debating. I yeah. think it's Samuel Green and Jonathan McClatchy. Yes, that's correct. So the reason I was put out by that is because I was thinking I want to debate that topic. Right. <laughs> so I was like, right. uh, somebody got in there on me, you know, yeah. before I even yeah. knew about it. And, and so. Right. George is talking to me and saying Shadid wants to debate. And I found out that Shadid did something. I think it was Sahi Luke who was here earlier who mentioned to me that Shadid had done something on the suffering servant. So anyways, uh, I've been looking at that passage more and the it's astounding the text, right? The, yeah. the, the fact that as, as many people have observed, Isaiah 53 is more descriptive of what's happening in the crucifixion than anything you'll find in the Gospels, mm -hmm. right? So here you have not only a prophecy, but it's far more detailed in what's happening than, than what you read in the Gospels. Right now, obviously, the Gospels are giving us the historical account, and they're giving us some of the bare details, right? Rejected, crucified. The Gospels don't even, you know, and in, in, in a lot of Christians might, might initially be 
shocked that they never even thought of this. Do you know that yeah. the Gospels never mention Jesus being nailed to the cross? Mm -hmm. That's just assumed, right? But yeah. it doesn't describe that sort of thing. But yeah. you do read in Isaiah of him being pierced and, and in Psalm 22. Prophecy yeah. in these cases is far more descriptive. But the reason I bring it up here is because a close study of the end of Isaiah 53, where it says, by the knowledge of him, uh, uh, or uh, some versions will say, by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify many. Mm -hmm. But the grammar, it's far more forceful. And and there, there's two different ways to render the knowledge aspect of it, which is you can either understand it objectively or subjectively, yeah. meaning either it's saying by his knowledge, meaning there's the, that he's the one, uh, uh, by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify many, meaning uh, by his activity, that's, mm -hmm. that's what will bring about their justification. Right. Or it can be subjective in the sense of in the knowledge of him, the righteous one, my servant, will justify many, meaning then faith, right? Through faith yeah. in him, we're justified. Either one of those are theologically true. But yes. here's the thing I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in. The, the, the Hebrew grammar at the end there, it literally means when you look at it, uh, you know, by the, uh, in the knowledge of him, the righteous one, my, my servant, will cause the many to be accounted yes. righteous. Right. I mean, very forceful. Yeah. That is the doctrine Absolutely. of justification. Absolutely. Right there in Isaiah. Yeah. Yeah. And also, uh, well, there's a reason why, Anthony, the, the Jews don't read Isaiah 53. They skip it in the in the synagogue liturgical readings. There's a reason for that, as you know. Um, but but even the language of he shall justify the many, you know, Mark 10, 45, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, and, and of course, it says in Isaiah 53, he poured out his soul unto death. You know, Philippians 2, he, he emptied himself, that pouring out, that language is very much in keeping with Isaiah, that he, 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 he emptied himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Isaiah 53, uh, you know, the doctrine of justification by faith uh, alone is not a Pauline invention. It's clearly there in Isaiah. And uh, and throughout the you know Genesis fifteen six the Lord, the Abraham believed on the Lord and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Yeah. yeah. So so let's, so just for the sake of time because we're almost going I think we're already on two hours Anthony I don't want to take too much of your time I just wanted to point out these two passages we're all familiar with them here in Ephesians two and Titus uh, three uh, notice Paul does not uh, Paul doesn't modify the word works to mean oh I'm talking about the works of the law here. Notice here that he, he doesn't modify it. He simply says, uh, by grace you have been saved. That's a perfect tense, uh, completed action in the past with ongoing results. Uh, through faith, and this is not your own doing. So this, this faith, this grace is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Notice there's nothing said here. Paul doesn't say, oh, by the way, I'm talking about the works of, of the law of Moses. He says, not a result of works. But notice how in verse 10, he goes on to say that works does have a place in our life. We are his workmanship created in Christ for good works. And notice this, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So even the good works we do, God has foreordained, uh, prepared that we should walk in them. So, so I think it's important to realize here, uh, Anthony, that I think you would agree with me. Paul doesn't modify the word works there. He just says grace and works, not by works. It's by grace. It's a gift. This is not your doing. It's a gift of God, which means it's not merited. God has freely given it to you, but he's created us for good works that we should uh, do them, not to be saved, but because we are saved. Yeah. And one thing is, if you try to make works there, mean works of Mosaic law, the distinctive ceremonial aspects, for example, what do you do with the the where it says we're created in Christ Jesus for good works? Yeah. So it, it, what Paul is saying is we're not we're, we're not saved as a result of works, but we are yeah. saved unto good works. Right. Right. So if if you say we're not saved by these ceremonial ordinances, but unto them, <laughs> that doesn't work because right. Paul doesn't allow for the necessity of these observances even yeah. for the believer, right? Even for the justified believer, right? Yeah. Circumcision yeah. is altogether off the table. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of, uh, you know, necessity, like right. e even even as an ethical matter. Right. Like he doesn't even say like he, he might say you do it for pragmatic purposes to to reach a Jew. 
yeah. you know, if, if, if in first century Israel, like not right. today, it wouldn't right. have the same effect. But anyway, right. so there's that, there's that issue. But yeah, the other thing is notice, notice how this order preserves that this is to the glory of God and not to our own uh, glory or for our own boasting, right? Paul says, right. not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Exactly. That's why the good works by following grace, faith, salvation, so forth, right, are not inconsistent with with uh, the, the removing all grounds for boasting, because these flow out of the work of Christ. Their their result, uh, yeah. So, excellent text. I, yeah. you know, yeah, as clearly yeah. as one could expect. Very clear. Uh, and, and then Titus three. Uh, but when the goodness and love and kindness of God our, our Savior appeared. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. Notice no, he doesn't modify it by saying, oh, by the way, it's the works of the law. He says not by works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, he by the washing of regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that by being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So once again, Paul is very clear God saved us, not because of any works that we've done in righteousness. So when the Roman Catholics say, oh, these are uh, Paul's against the works of the law of Moses, but 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 not against works of righteousness that that the sacraments or, or the infusion of grace gives us. That's not what Paul is saying. He says it's not by any works of righteousness that we do that we're saved. Not at all. It's by grace and not of works. I think I think it's a very well established fact here in, in terms of Paul. Yeah, and so notice the not, but, you know, uh, I, was it um, Martin Lloyd-Jones who is famous for the the, the but God line? <laughs> yeah. Especially, especially in Ephesians 2, right? Yeah. Ephesians uh, 2, 2 1 begins, begins by saying uh, you're dead in your trespasses yeah. and sins yeah. and then paints this very dismal picture of yeah. humanity, leaves yeah. you completely without any hope. And then yeah. it, eventually it transitions and it says, but god being yeah. rich in mercy because yeah. of the great love with which he loved us right yeah. so it the, the whole transition is but god right so yeah. everything else is what's true of us and how hopeless we are on it on that account but god right yeah. that's what introduces all the difference in the world well here you have the same kind of thing where paul is saying you know not by works of righteousness not by works done by us in righteousness but yeah. according to his own mercy yeah, and, and so forth. So that's the critical hinge, right? I mean, and that's, and I, you know, I, I, I try to say this as often as I can for the sake of somebody who's hearing me for the first time, you know, but people who have heard me have heard me say it a lot, but it's, you know, I honestly don't get why anybody would not want to embrace this and why they would hanker about for some other gospel. There's nothing more lovely than this gospel. Oh, it's amazing. And, it's and, amazing. And, yeah. And, and I mean, you know, why go chasing after something else? And it's sort of like the, the sort of rebuke we might give to a guy who has a beautiful wife who's chasing somebody else. Yeah. Why are you such a, a buffoon? Not that anybody, you know, if they're married, they, they, they should be faithful to their wife. I'm just saying for, for illustrative purposes, you yeah. know, let's like just say this guy's wife is a beauty queen or something, and he's out there chasing somebody else. And you yeah. think, why would you be such a, a, a buffoon to chase after that? And then in this case, though, the the, the, the there's a there's more of a disparity. The, yeah. the guy who has, let's say, this beauty queen might be chasing another beautiful woman. But this other gospel that people are talking about compared to the gospel of Christ is an ugly woman. Yes. I mean, I, I'm just being frank with you. Yeah. She's not attractive at all. I have no idea why yeah. it, it almost it like it's like they're coming from a theological trailer park and they think that this this gospel that's all beat up and bruised is yeah. more lovely than the gospel of Christ. No, it's it's ugly. It's, it's as ugly yeah. as I could possibly imagine. Yeah. And I, again, I just for the life of me, I see this and I'm like, what is wrong? What has gotten into the heads of people that once heard this gospel that yeah. are now being attracted to this thing? Yeah. You know, um. I mean, I see that sort of thing playing out on cops all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm being facetious, but yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. The trailer park where some guy, you know, chasing after the, you know, <laughs> the, the crack, somebody on crack, and the wife is over there fighting with her. Exactly. Exactly.
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's amazing that, you know, I guess uh, people just want to keep justifying themselves. And so they, they want to justify their, their works. And, and, uh, and let's face it, Anthony, I think people, uh, the, the unregenerate heart hates uh, the gospel of grace. Why did Cain become so angry with Abel? Think about it. Abel brought uh, a, a lamb uh, from his flock and Abel offered up that lamb. Uh, because, of course, the lamb being a type of Christ, and he understood the idea of blood atonement. I'm sure Adam and Eve told them about how God killed those creatures in the garden and clothed them. And, and I have no doubt that Abel would have learned that from his parents. We know no one knew about sacrifice as well. Uh, but Cain brought the work of, you know, the, the earth was cursed, and the, the, the labor of his hands, the sweat of his brow, uh, he brought his works to God, and God did not show favor towards Cain. Um, and so Charles Spurgeon once put it this way. He said that the sons of Cain continue to do battle against the sons of Abel today. And so the sons of Cain are those who envy the sons of Abel because God shows favor to us on the basis of the blood of the lamb without works. Whereas Cain thought, you know, my work and, 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 and my, my effort should have been acknowledged by God. And so what does he do? He becomes envious. He stews in his anger and uh, he ends up killing his brother. The first murder, homicide recorded in the Bible, Cain kills his brother over a spiritual matter. Uh, so I think mm -hmm. I think it's very sad, Anthony, that, you know, I come from a Roman Catholic background and, you know, it pained my heart to see my family uh, just not thinking they were doing good enough good works. They They had to do mass. They had to pray their rosaries and so forth and so on. And there I am. I, I've entered into God's rest, and and I and you know I God by His marvelous grace saved my mom and my grandmother and and but but most of my family remains uh, in this darkness that they need to please God by their good works. And the best they can hope for, Anthony, is purgatory. They're not looking forward to heaven. They they're all saying we're going to purgatory because we're just not good enough. And you're right, you're not good enough. But Christ is sufficient. Christ is all in all. And we are accepted in the beloved. So, yeah, that's that's as Paul said. My heart grieves over my people. My the heavy sorrow in my heart for Israel. I have a great sorrow in my heart for you know a lot of my Roman Catholic family members and 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 Roman Catholics in general. Yeah, and, and of course Rome is just one instantiation of this whole wrong headed mindset. Uh, I've mentioned Mormons today. Yeah. You know about yeah. Mormons. You've engaged other groups. You know that all of them are marked by this. It, all of them. It may not be the same exact works. It may not be, you know, all the same hoops, but it is works. It is hoops. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the work of Christ is not yeah. viewed as sufficient and yeah. so forth. So they're all laboring under this. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I, I, for the life of me, I don't know why. When they yeah. hear this, well, I, I said that and you, you actually already answered it you know, people are, are, you know, it's a stumbling block to them, yeah. especially if they're still in the grips of their own, you know, uh, if they're still assuming their own inherent goodness, if they're, if they're ultimately seeking to yeah. bolster their own pride and that sort of thing. You know, one thing I was going to say about Genesis four that came to mind is uh, a Hebrew professor of mine back when I was in seminary wrote an article on this. And I think it was something like, um, it, it was a play off of the movie title, crouching tiger, hidden dragon. Um, I can't remember the exact title of it, but what he pointed out is the, the context in Genesis three, where they're banished from the garden, the flaming, the, the cherubim, the flaming sword are, are right. Uh, positioned at the entrance barring, uh, access to the garden. But there's also this suggestion that this is where they might've gone to meet with God. Right. So subsequent to being banished from the garden, where would they have come and presented their sacrifices? Well, naturally, they would have returned to the gates of the Garden of Eden, where the cherubim were, just like yeah. the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, where right. the, the atonement was made. And what's interesting is, um, so he pointed out, as you, as you know, the word for sin and sin offering is the same in Hebrew. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so there's a very real possibility that when God said to Cain, uh, you know, um, he talks about sin crouching at the door. Yeah. You know, a lot of people read that as like, you know, sin, <laughs> sin is trying to get you to do something really bad, but you know, you can, you can subdue this where there's, whereas there's a, this possibility that what God is telling him, you know, his, his sacrifice, his, his offering, not sacrifice, his offering has been rejected. 
and God's saying that there's a sin offering crouching at the door. In other words, come in the right way, right? Come, come in the, you know, and you'll be accepted. I yeah. just throw that out there for, for people. Uh, but in any case, I think it's still valid that the, the, yeah. the way of, of approaching God is through sacrifice. Yes. That's why Abel's accepted. Right. And, and of course he's coming in faith, you know, and, right. and Cain is not as illustrated by coming and bringing his own bloodless offering right. rather than the kind of offering that the sinner right. needs. But, right. Exactly. Well, uh, I, I thought we would probably end with this one and then we'll, we'll go to our questions. I know some of our, our viewers are asking about questions. We are going to get to you, but we need to just address this. As you know, uh, uh, Anthony, that this is the go-to text that almost every cult goes to. So Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, even our Roman Catholic friends, those in the Orthodox tradition, they all go to James. And, and the first, the first uh, faulty assumption is that they assume that James is, is contradicting Paul. At least that's the liberal uh, argument. Um, so the text is there before us. And I think it's important for us to realize, uh, and I think you would agree with me, Anthony, that, that the works that James is talking about here is works before men. He's not talking about works before God. That is, how are we justified before God? We are justified before God by faith, but we are justified before men by works. In other words, men cannot see our hearts. They need to see our actions. And so I think the crucial verse here is where James says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? So what faith is he talking about? A faith that doesn't produce good works is no faith at all. And then, of course, he goes on and talks about faith without works is dead, which 100% Paul would agree with that. And he talks about two types of people in the church, those who have faith but don't show anything, have no works to show, and those would be uh, counterfeit Christians. And then there are those who have faith and produce works. And then he gives examples of Abraham and, and Rahab and so forth. But maybe let's just talk a little bit about this, Anthony, because this is usually the, the go-to passage that they all go to. And they'll say, well, look, 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 uh, James actually says that uh, we're not justified by faith alone in verse 24, uh, even though the context of James here is very different. So uh, I'll, I'll let you have at it. Yeah, so first I would just uh, say what you said, where it says, can that faith save him? In the Greek, faith there is articular. And the idea is now, so I mentioned this because some Roman Catholics think that this is an illicit translation when it says, can that faith save him? They object, right. you know, it shouldn't be translated that way. They want it to say, can faith save him? Mm -hmm. But it's articular in Greek. And yeah. uh, it's, it's clearly functioning in an anaphoric way, right? Yeah. So for those that don't know you, like here's an English sentence. If I, if I say a man approached me in a store and the man said to me hey they're having a sale on apples notice that i moved from calling him a man to calling him the man right because when i first introduced him you don't know who he is but now you have a little bit of context so when i say the man i'm referring back to the one i introduced right as a man who approached me right so when james says can the faith save him or can that faith save him he's pointing back to the faith that he just got through talking about right a faith right. that has no works and that has always been the evangelical protestant view always it, 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 an empty faith that just mutters something isn't true faith right that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about faith true faith means you have knowledge of of, of christ and the gospel you're assenting to the truth of those things you're not just factually aware of them but you you assent to them as true and you're trusting in christ right of of necessity that's going to result in a certain kind of activity okay now the activity isn't to be confused with the faith but that faith will in fact issue forth in activity right? right if you believe something like you can't say you know if i tell you i have this hamburger in my hand and i tell you i believe this hamburger is laced with lethal poison that can't be remedied. Right. And then I tell you, I don't want to die, and then I proceed to eat the hamburger. Okay, those things don't go together. You know that one of them has to be false. Either right. I don't really believe that it's laced with lethal, unremedied poison, 
or I don't want to die. I mean, one of those right. has to be right. false. Right. right. So I don't really believe those. You know, it's, it's not really faith because the right. actions are inconsistent with it. So right. that's what James is talking about. A false faith here. A faith that doesn't produce good works isn't the kind of faith that unites one to Christ and, and saves. Right. And right. as you're saying, when, when it comes to us, how do we know whether it's this kind of faith or that kind mm -hmm. of faith? We don't know it otherwise than by their actions. Right. And, and here you, you can think of the difference, say, between Jesus and John 2. Remember when uh, it says that many people believed on Jesus? And yeah. then it says, as if to indicate that this isn't saving faith, Jesus, for his part, was not entrusting himself to them right. because right. he knew what was in man. In other words, this was not a true, genuine faith. It's more like a faith in his signs. The, right. the, the, not that the signs aren't calculated to lead us to true faith, but there's a difference between just believing in this like more entertainment sense right. or, you know, oh, what a great uh, wonder worker kind of thing, or actually believing in him as the one that these signs are pointing to. Right. The, the reality, right, when it like he's the bread of life, he's the light of life. Are we really believing that? Well, so anyway, so the, there's true faith, there's false faith. Right. And the only way we can know it, because we don't know what's in a man, is by what comes out of him. Jesus right. said, right, out of the over, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, you know, right. uh, uh, or out of the heart proceeds murders, adulteries, blasphemies, theft. Matthew uh, 15. Right. Mm -hmm. So these things show themselves outwardly. And that's the kind of thing that James is driving at here. But right. now think about, you know, a couple of things. Um, I, I don't want to get too too much into. Uh, some aspects of this, because I'm hoping it comes up with my debate with William, if he ever, right. if he ever gets uh, around to debating me on this. Uh, but uh, it should be evident that, that there's there's two things going on here. James is uh, notice he 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 says uh, in verse 23, the script and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham yeah. believed God and, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Right. So you have a, a Kai Kai construction here where, yeah. you know, Kai is used twice. Mm -hmm. and, and you know that Kai by itself can sometimes mean also. In yeah. fact, it's translated that way numerous times in James. But right. this is especially true when you have two Kais, right? So you have uh, where, you know, in other words, the second Kai uh, is, is talking about something additional or also. Right. So, in other words, what I'm getting at is James has two things in view here. A, a legitimate translation of this would, could be in verse 23, both the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, and also he was called a friend of God. So two right. things in view here. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him his, as righteousness. He's justified before God. But also, he was called by people the friend of God. This is an allusion to First yeah. Chronicles, yeah. where people call him the friend of God. And yeah. on what basis? Because Abraham obeyed God in offering up Isaac, right? right? So you have two things in view here. Belief in what God promised regarding the future seed on the basis of which he's justified. And then Abraham showing forth his faith in offering up Isaac on the basis of which people long after that look back and say, yes, Abraham had true faith. He believed in God. He was a friend of God. He obeyed God. Now, why is that significant? Because verse 14, contra, even what many Protestants think, has been badly understood. If, if you look at the Greek, and I'm, I'm just shocked that, that so many people haven't done this. Yeah. If you look at the Greek, it doesn't actually say, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. The What many people think is that the, the Greek word there, manon, is an adjective modifying faith, right? but it's not. I mean, you look at it in the Greek, and it's not even an adjective modifying faith in the Latin. And so you could find numerous scholarly treatments of this. I mean, think about it this way. Let me put it this way. If you were to look at early patristic uh, you know, comments, they use the phrase, nobody can deny this, even if they will, I mean, they might want to reinterpret it or whatever, but just follow this out they yeah. use the phrase faith alone positively yes, yes. often right whatever interpretation you want to give that doesn't matter they use it positively here's the question why do they never think they have to reconcile that phraseology with james 224 they never try to reconcile this 
-hmm. Why? Because it doesn't even say you're not justified by faith alone. That's not an accurate reading right. of the Greek. Right. Now, what's really going on here is Paul has two things in view. Paul is saying, you see that a man is, uh, you see that a person is justified by works and not only justified by faith. So he's talking about two justifications, one before right. God on right. the basis of faith and one before men through our works. That's why it was so critical to observe in verse 23 that he talks about two, two distinct things, right? Being uh, justified before God through faith and being called the friend of God by people in view of his actions and so forth. Sure. So sure. that's that's my understanding of what's going on here. And that accounts for why these early fathers never thought they had to, to reconcile this because right. there was nothing to reconcile there. And uh, it's, again, it's even that way in the Latin. And uh, so the, the, in other words, the, the, the word alone doesn't grammatically agree with the word faith. So it has to refer back to something earlier in the sentence, in this case, justified. So right. it's talking, you could legitimately translate it. You see that a, uh, a person is, uh, well, I would invert it for the sake of English syntax, but uh, you see that a person is justified by faith, uh, or you see that a person is not only justified by faith, but also justified by works. And that in the context, meaning before God and then before men. Right. And, and Paul talks about this kind of thing too, where there's this yeah. sense of being justified by works before men and this sense of being justified before God through faith, yeah. right? Yeah. Me remember when he said, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but right. not and before not God. God. Yeah, that's right. Right. Exactly. So that presupposes this distinction. Right. So sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, if I behave like a scandalous wretch, you, you're not going to look at me as, uh, you know, you're not going to approve of me. You're not going to say that, uh, you know, th this is, th this is a guy showing for faith in Christ or what have you. Exactly. You know, um, Exactly. And, yeah. So that's that's my view of James two in a yeah. nutshell. I, I think I think you're right. I, I think it's supported by the rest of Scripture. Uh, Jesus said you would know them by their fruit, uh, and also Matthew five sixteen. After Jesus just said that that you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world, in Matthew five sixteen he says, therefore let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works. And praise your Father, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So there in Matthew five sixteen, Jesus makes it very clear that you're supposed to show your light. And how do you show your light? By good works, so that men may see. Men cannot see your faith in the heart. Only God sees the heart. Uh, and, and going back to uh, John 2, where it says that many believed in him, but he didn't entrust himself. Uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, Anthony, but it's the same Greek word, pistio, pistueo, which means to believe. Uh, it literally says, um, many believed in him, but Jesus did not believe them. He didn't have belief in them mm. and trust them. So it's, it's, it's a play on words because it's the same Greek word. Mm. So while they believed in him, he didn't believe in them. Uh, and, and so I, and so, and Paul himself points out, right, that we are created to do good works. Uh, Philippians 2.12, uh, uh, work out your, your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God. Verse 13. Uh, Philippians 2.13, it is God who is working in you to uh, to to do his good will and his, and his pleasure and his, to his purpose and so forth. So what James is saying here, and remember, James agrees with Paul. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, whether I preach the gospel or they, the apostles, preach the gospel, uh, we, we, we preach the same message. It was the same gospel that we preached. James gave Paul the right hand of fellowship, according to the book of Acts. And so in the Council of Jerusalem, they agreed that we're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when people try to pit James uh, against Paul and even the great Luther, Mark Luther, at, at the beginning, uh, I think he misunderstood James. He thought James was an epistle of straw and that James was was somehow um, not on the same level as as the other uh, letters of the New Testament because of that. But uh, but later on, I think Luther showed that he did come around and, and finally understood that James was not actually attacking Paul's doctrine. Yeah, you know, one thing I'd say for <clears throat> Luther is there's a principle there that, you know, is not uh, objectionable per se, 
which is what Paul lays down in Galatians, where he he shows the primacy of the message over the messenger, yeah. such that even if Paul himself were to preach otherwise, then he's to be anathema. And that would follow for Luther. If I mean, for, yeah. excuse me, for James and for Luther. <laughs> If yeah. either one of them preaches a different gospel, then so much the worse for either one of them. Right. Uh, and 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 Paul can say that sort of thing because, number one, he proves that his gospel is found in the Old Testament. He argues on the basis of the Old Testament to defend his gospel. And number two, the gospel had verified itself among the Galatians. So anything that would come along later, would, you know, would already be, con uh, you know, contrary to what had already verified itself. Right. right. So. You know, L Luther is saying, you know, in effect to the, the to the Romanists, look, if you're going to interpret Luther in a way that disagrees with the gospel, then so much the worse, you know, mm -hmm. for the epistle of James. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think his problem was not being able to see initially how James could be reconciled with Paul. Right. Right. And so I but I understand the struggle there, because if if James is disagreeing, then you know that yeah. would that wouldn't be proof that the gospel's false, but that the epistle of James is false because right. the gun, the gospel has primacy and, you know, but anyways, Luther, in fact, I think Luther, one of his things he said was, if anybody could solve this for me, I'll give them my doctor's cap or something like that. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that was like uh, his way of saying that you would, you will have proven yourself. Well, whatever else your credentials might be, you will yeah. prove it, you will have proven yourself to be a doctor of Holy Scripture. Right. If you can if you can un untangle this knot for right. me. Right. But yeah, he never officially rejected James or, right. or struck it from the Bible. Right. It was in his German Bible, his right. translation and all that. Yeah. But anyways. Yeah. OK, well, thanks so much, Anthony. So we're just going to take some questions. So, folks, if you have any questions, please place a Q there, capital Q in front. And uh, so hopefully I won't miss in any um, here. Uh, let me know if I do, um, Anthony, but uh, uh, let me just scroll down here and see if we have uh, any questions here. Um, so there was a, a super chat from Smidley way back where he said uh, the gospel or the, the Bible is a hymn book and he spells yeah. him capital H I M. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. And thank yeah. you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, a donation there. And let me see, let me just try to, uh, grab any other questions that we might have here. Uh, a lot of comments here. Um, there's a question here, uh, Anthony, uh, uh, Anthony, I think one, six plus years ago, you said the Islamic God's love is contingent on the existence of his own creation, but is God's justness, just justness, I guess, justice contingent on his creation. Yeah, I think so. I'm not even sure how he might construe that. I'm just trying to think through mm -hmm. in what sense. So what 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 I'm getting at is that the persons of the Trinity, with respect to love, they love each other, right? There's a, a perfect communion, delight, love among them, and in effect, God's wrath is His outraged love. So it's not as if, uh, you know, it's not as if creation brings about uh, the, the basis for this. In other words, I mean, it, it, wrath is the expression of God's outraged love, which is which is not contingent on creation. I'm not really sure what he means by just justness is rectitude. I think the person of the Trinity are are uh, perfectly just among themselves uh, there's there's no lack of conformity or transgression of the other and i mean i i don't know i'm i i wish he could spell it out a little bit more but uh yeah, yeah. i'm just having trouble trying to figure out what he what he might mean by that right um certainly if you're talking about justice in the sense of retributive justice there needs to be an object of that but yeah. justice is rooted in God's righteous character, which is not right. contingent on creation. God is yeah. righteous apart from creation. Right. Yeah. I, I think some theologians would refer to God's justice as one of his secondary attributes. That is that it's revealed in his mercy and 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 in his law and so forth. Um, but that all flows out of his uprightness, his, his righteousness and so forth. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's just move on uh, here. See if there's... Uh, any other questions? 
Uh, we have a question here from, uh, this is from Steve, Steve Christie. Anthony, since the Roman Catholic Church conflates righteousness with sanctification, doesn't Romans 6.19 st uh, stating righteousness leads to sanctification contradict this? Um, good question. I haven't really thought of that particular, um, let me just see it real quick, uh, Romans 16. 619. Yeah, I mean, sorry. Uh, I'm looking at the right passage. Um, so, I mean, the, the reason I pause initially is because sanctification can be used in different ways. Uh, sometimes and more, most often it refers to that definitive setting apart because the word sanctify means to set apart. That definitive setting apart that takes place at the beginning of the Christian life. And even then, it's not talking about a moral issue. It's not talking about moral transformation. It's just talking about positionally the believer yeah. by virtue of being in Christ is set aside from a common to a holy purpose and, and so forth. But it can also be used to refer to the goal of the Christian life, uh, the pursuit of holiness and, and transformation. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I would say here that the, the, the problem the Romanist has uh, in terms of the larger picture is that Romans 6 follows Romans 3, 4, and 5, right? So here Paul is talking about pursuing righteousness and, and sanctification, and this is subsequent to his already having talked about justification, right? So this, this follows in the order of Paul's systematic presentation of the gospel. A discussion of, of pursuing righteousness follows his already establishing that we are justified in Christ. And uh, but, but the other thing is, it's, he, he says here, Present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Yeah, that, that is definitely problematic to the Roman view. He's, he's saying, you know, we, we are righteous in Christ. And because that's who we are in Christ, we are to yield our members as such, right? It's like saying, it's like a father telling his kid, hey, look, you are a, in my case, let's say Rogers, right? You are a Rogers. Act like it, right? We act this way in these contexts. You know, I mean, that's some yeah. some families will talk that way. Right. Like especially royalty, you have to act in a way that shows forth, you know, your royal character. It doesn't mean if you're not acting that way, you aren't. That isn't your status. It means that you're 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 bringing shame on that status, but you still are from that family. Well, Paul is saying in Christ, you're righteous. So present yourselves as slaves of righteousness. Right. And and pursue sanctification. The Roman Catholic can't really do that. I mean, you either are righteous and, and God justifies you. And uh, I mean, they, it's a pretty confused system when you think about it, though, because they talk about an increase of justification, which to them means an increase of sanctification. But I don't know how you increase something. If, if, if justification is on the Roman view, God eradicating sin from the soul of leaving only concupiscence behind, then I don't know how you move from one degree of glory to another in sanctification. I don't know how that works. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, yeah, I, I think it's a problematic text, but part of it too is because the Roman Catholic system is more problematic than most Roman Catholics are usually aware of or upfront about. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with you uh, on that. I, I think it goes back to Luther's uh, Justus e. Uh, 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 simul uh, peccator, simul meaning that we're, we're just, but yet at the same time, we're a sinner. So we're still, I mean, our sanctification is is progressive and we're still, uh, you know, battling the flesh, Romans 7, right? Uh, the good that I want to do, I don't do. And the wrong I don't, I don't want to do, I do. And who shall deliver me from this dilemma? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Christ. So, uh, yeah, I saw, yeah, I totally agree with you on that one, Anthony. Uh, okay, let me see here. Uh, so we have uh, uh, Steve again. Uh, uh, Dr. Costa, Rome claims to infallibly interpret the Bible. What is the response to the magisterium only having interpreting seven verses at most? Um, yeah, th th that response is, I, I find the response very, very weak because uh, they say, well, you can't, you know, you can't understand the Bible without the, the magisterium infallibly interpreting it, but there's Next to what Matthew 16, 18 and John 21 and, and some of the papal, supposed papal passages, most of the Bible has not been infallibly interpreted by Rome. Uh, <laughs> so, so imagine 
So imagine me as a father, right? The, yeah. the scripture says yeah. that he who doesn't take care of his own is worse than an infidel. He's denied yeah. the faith, right? Yeah. But imagine me as a father saying, yeah, okay, it's my job to put food on the table and so forth. And without me, they can't have their necessary nourishment and so forth. Yeah. And then somebody says, I'm, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do and what I claim to do. And I say, well, yes, I have. I fed my kids the last 20 years at least seven times, right? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> right. I, I have I have put food on the table seven times. I don't think anybody in their right mind would consider me a dutiful father, a good father. Uh, and and I would qualify. I would fall under Paul's censor of somebody who's not taking care of his own family and has denied the faith. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have to say, I think that the Pope is uh, spectacularly negligent if he has the the ability to infallibly interpret things, but, but hasn't. Yeah. Then he, he's been asleep at the wheel of his studies. And, you know, that ship's gone over the cliff several times. Yeah. And it's all his fault in the sense that at least he's 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 being negligent. Yeah. And, and then besides that, like I said before, they bring this in as though it gets past a supposedly insurmountable problem that Protestants have. Right. Yeah. We can't agree with each other when we interpret the Bible. So the magisterium solves this problem. Rome hasn't done more than offer its explanation on a, uh, than on a couple of verses. And then even then, their ambiguous statements end up being yeah. the end of no little controversy among Roman Catholics who, you know, trip over each other like, uh, you know, like yeah. we're in a parking lot full of, uh, <laughs> what, you know, uh, one of those things that they put uh, so your car doesn't go too far. Anyways. Pylons, uh, curbs, the curbs. Yeah. I, I mean, so... The, these guys can't agree with each other. I mean, that's why yeah. you have all these different orders that, you know, they pretend they're more unified than they are. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah the last what's time their the response? Pope, yeah. The last time the Pope has actually fed them was 72 years ago. 1950 <laughs> was the last time they made an ex cathedra pronouncement about the Assumption of Mary. So since 1950, the Pope hasn't infallibly uh, dogmatized any doctrine. So, yeah, like you said, it's that it's the dad that it's it's the deadbeat dad who pretends that he cares about his family but doesn't provide for them. So yeah, and think about it. Even that, what what is it that the Pope is infallibly interpreting yeah. when he talks about the assumption of Mary? I didn't see any interpretation along with that. No, was no. he exegeting some particular text of the Bible? So even there, it's like he's not even he's not even infallibly interpreting. He's just yeah. infallibly declaring. Right. Yeah. The, the, the yeah. pontiff is punting the actual exegesis. Yeah. He's, he's not giving it to us. Exactly. Uh, I think you may have answered this question already. Um, so I think you've already answered that, uh, uh, Anthony, <laughs> that uh, the likelihood of you debating Albrecht, I think, is probably slim to none. I, yeah, I don't know what's going on with that. I'm, I'm not going to chase the guy. If you got to chase a guy who, you know, you don't want a restraining order, right, Anthony? You don't want a restraining yeah, I, order. I, I mean, it's weird. If somebody puts themselves out there as an apologist and you got to chase them, I, I think, I don't know if I said it earlier, but I, I've thought it several times recently. Th this guy's making it harder to get him to debate than I think it's going to be to actually debate him. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and that's not me trying to be proud or arrogant or anything like that. Uh, I believe this gospel. This is this is what I stake my entire salvation, my entire confidence before God on this. I'm mm. not going to debate some man who's who's challenging it. If I can't, if I don't have the confidence to debate him on this, what confidence could I possibly claim that I have in this before God? Right now, I'm not saying everybody has to be willing to debate. Not everybody's a debater and so forth. But I, he's a, he's an apologist. Why isn't he out there running to to do this? And he suggested to his people that he was. And so I, I just I, I find it shameful and, and disreputable and all the rest that he he isn't he isn't, you know, doing what he said he was going to do. And, and I think he should just say instead of like he's accusing me of, of lying and saying he, he didn't agree, you know, or saying he agreed when he didn't to to do it, date uh, debate on that particular date. Instead of lying, he should just say he doesn't want to debate or set a new date. Yeah. And, and that should yeah. be it. I mean, I'm happy to debate somebody else. I've even gone on record saying I don't think he's the best representative of the Catholic position on this. It was their side who said they think he is. And I'm fine with that. They can choose whoever they want. You know, yeah. uh, you know, if I, so, for well, I won't I won't go on with that. But I, I just I, I think there are other Roman Catholics that are are, you know, I think Robertson Genesis is probably better on this topic. Mm -hmm. Uh, he wrote a whole book on justification by faith that I read 
a long time ago, you know, I, but anyways, I think yeah. you should just say he doesn't want to debate and then, sure. and then I'll move on and, and debate somebody else. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, okay. So Steve Christie uh, for both, how can Rome say Protestants are separated brethren and can enter heaven, but Vatican one, Vatican one calls us schismatics, heretics, Florence condemns us to hell. Yeah, exactly. That was the point we were making earlier, uh, Steve, that, uh, the Roman Catholic Church is like the chameleon. It just seems to change its colors to suit its environment. And uh, and this has been called out by the state of Aconists. Even the Eastern Orthodox have called them out on this. Um, so this is just an example of the, the the evolution in the Roman Catholic Church. It's it's a walking contradiction. Um, and this is not a sign of, of, of unity, doctrinal unity. It is definitely not a sign of God leading the church. You want to add to that, Anthony? No, no, I think okay. it's, uh, I mean, and, and, and Trent, of course, of course, um, yeah. I, I keep saying Trent because Trent is where they officially define their view of justification. Yeah. yeah. And, and you have these anathemas in, in Trent and in, in other councils, but Rome has tried to redefine it as today as just excommunication, which is irrelevant given what, I mean, that doesn't get them out of the problem because, According to Rome, outside of the church, there is no salvation. Now, right. we would say something like outside of the church, there's no ordinary way of salvation. I mean, because yeah. in the church is where the gospel's preached. And, yeah. and, you know, but a person can hear the gospel on a desert island. I mean, we're not excluding that, those possibilities and that sort of thing. But Rome does. Rome yeah. says that, you know, you need to be saved in her. And, and uh, she's critical to your salvation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you need her sacraments and and all the rest. So, um you know, it, I don't know how they put these things together. Yeah. I, I know how they him and ha when we bring them up, but I, I don't know how they put them yeah. together. I mean, I mean, you know, the, the, the Latin phrase extra ecclesium nalus salus, outside of the church, there is no salvation. I mean, there's a sense in which as Protestants, we can agree with that because we're baptized into the church by the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. And so, and also Cyprian said, you cannot have God as your father if you don't have the church as your mother. So yeah. when we yeah. speak of the church, we're obviously we're talking about the body of Christ here. Uh, we're not talking about some institutionalized CEO in Rome, in the Vatican City, that if you're not part of that physical uh, organization, that, that you're not saved. Um, so there is a sense in which we could agree, yeah, uh, if you are redeemed, the Spirit of God baptizes you into the body of Christ. And so, and so that's why some of the fathers use the church and the, the Ark of Noah and so forth. Um, so that we can agree on. But when, but, but if what Rome means is what you know, for example, what the, the Orthodox Church means and what the, the Mormon Church has also said, that unless you're part of the Mormon Church, part of the Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, you can't be saved. That, I think, flies against the testimony of Scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Smidley, for uh, the Bible is the hymn book. Thank you again. Uh, all right. Let me just move along here. Uh, we have another question. Uh, why not contact Marlon and tell William and Sam that Tony Cost and Anthony would debate William and Sam on the topic above? It will give Willie confidence. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm all up for a tag debate, uh, but uh, will he do it? That's the question. Yeah. So I said, now see, here's what I said. Cause I, I, I I'm, I'm a gracious fellow, right. In the sense that, uh, are magnanimous and all, you know, well, let me tell it right <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is this, like I haven't had people come on my show precisely because I know that that getting into a, a an interchange with with these fellows means in some respects, you got to be ready for a food fight. And, yeah. and I grew up in, in that sort of thing, you know, so I'm perfectly fine with somebody wanting to sling mud at me and all that. That doesn't matter. I mean, yeah. I don't go to bed at night with confidence before God, because somebody else likes me or not, you know, yeah. my only hope is in Christ. So I don't care what people say. And I, but I haven't wanted to bring other people into that, you know, so I'm sort of in my mind, probably protecting some people who don't even feel like they need protecting, but like, I just, I haven't tried to bring people into that. So what I, one of the things I have said is I'd be happy to debate both of them by myself. I, I'd be happy to be, debate either one of them separately or both of them at the same time. Yeah, uh, but I, I'm perfectly willing for a team debate. Yeah. But I, I so the the way this all came about though was Sam, Sam threw William out there because he didn't want to debate it, and he kept saying he's not competent to debate this. And and one of the things that astounds me about this is how does a guy shift his ground, shift his position with respect to the gospel, and then say he doesn't feel competent 
that he's able to represent this, then then how did you feel confident enough to change your position? That just astounds me. Yeah. Yeah. You would seriously give up this gospel without even being sure that you had yeah. the goods to, yeah. to de demonstrate it. Yeah. So I don't know that he would, but I'd be happy to do it even by myself or with Tony. Yeah, I'm, game. I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'm game. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, you're you're their uh, you're their Huckleberry, uh, Anthony. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. Cool. Musso, would you say that Paul quotes Genesis 15, 6 to show that we are justified by putting faith in the word of the Lord rather than an increase in justice? Uh, as Roman Catholics would say, the text is very clear that Abraham believed on the Lord and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. And Paul uh, interprets that passage uh, as it says that his faith was reckoned as righteousness and and he, he was declared righteous by God before circumcision, before God gave him the covenant of circumcision in Genesis 17. So that's why Genesis 15, verse 6 is so important. Um, so um, so uh, the Roman Catholic Church definitely, there, this idea of increasing injustice, again, ju justification is declarative. It's something that God declares. It's not a sense of gradation. It's a declarative forensic act of God by declaring uh, uh, the, the ungodly to be, uh, to be just. You want to add to that, Anthony, or... Yeah, one thing I'm wondering is he puts the emphasis on word there, and I'm wondering if he's, you know, in the context, and he may not have this in view, but uh, when I think about that context and the, the phrase word, the, the I mean, there's two senses in which you could mean, yeah. right? But but in 15, it says the word of the Lord appeared to Abraham right, and said. So you've got this odd way of speaking where you think of the word as what's spoken, but instead it's the word that speaks, right? The word appears and speaks. Yeah. And then it says he took him outside, meaning he took yeah, Abraham outside. Yeah. So this is the word that's interacting with Abraham. Mm. And so it's him that Abraham's believing when he says these things. Right. So there's that sense in which you could think of him believing the word of the Lord. But then there's also the sense in believing what he said, yeah. uh, which is the promise of the, the coming seed. It, it's interesting, you know, that uh, Paul in Galatians makes this point about the seed being singular and and some people will will balk at this because the word seed in Hebrew yeah. can function either way as a singular yeah. or plural. But there's actually some some technical stuff that one can get into where you can tell when Paul or excuse me when Moses has in view a particular seed or mm -hmm. a a multitude of Collector. people. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, without getting into that though, but uh, the the basic gist here is that Abraham's believing God's promise which is centered on that coming seed. He's the one in whom these promises are going to be realized. So he's, he's looking forward in advance to Jesus. Now, yeah. I, the other thing to bring in here is I think that, that he has in, in, in mind is the Catholics will say Abraham believed God prior to Genesis 15, right? At the tail end of chapter 11 of Genesis. And then in chapter 12, Abraham leaves his father yeah. and 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 goes so and so forth and and Hebrews tells us that uh, by faith Abraham left. So we know Abraham had faith before this. A couple of things that could be said here. Number one is when we say that we're justified by faith, we're talking about particularly faith in Christ, faith in the gospel. Uh, one might just as well, but could say that Abraham had faith, but it was not yet that faith in the gospel because that had not yet been declared to him. Right. Or we could simply say that what's going on in Genesis 15 is that Abraham's exercise of faith there, which is what justifies, unites to, to God and, and, and so forth, uh, that it's just that justification being reiterated. We don't deny, like if somebody has been declared righteous, we don't say that the judge can't repeat himself, you know, yeah. or yeah. it's not like you're being re-justified yeah. in the yeah. sense of you were and then you lost it. Now you're being justified. There's no evidence Abraham lost justification and right. now is being re-justified. Besides right. that, think of how this explodes the Roman Catholic view of justification. According to Roman Catholics, one is initially justified, you know, through faith and baptism and these sorts of things. But then when they sin and have to be re-justified, it's on the basis of confession and penance and, and yeah. these sorts of things. Genesis 15, if it's an example of Abraham being re-justified subsequently, why does Paul emphasize that it's by faith that Abraham was justified, not by works? 
This right. would this would be a post justification justification, which right. doesn't fit the Roman scheme because their post justification justification is not by faith alone; it's by works. But Paul says this justification was by faith. I mean, it just doesn't even fit the yeah. Roman system. Right. And, right. I mean, so many problems with this. That definitely, it, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's just move along here. Uh, uh, Crystal, yes, I did see your question, and I will uh, I will get uh, to you on that. Sorry, I've been busy, but uh, thank you for reminding me. I will get uh, to your question. Uh, okay. So, Ryan, um, ESV translates Hebrew 1131 as Rahab did not perish because, but this seems like a problem. How is the participle dexamine functioning in the verse? Uh, so I would have to take a quick look at, uh, Hebrews 11, 31, um, just to get the context here. Um, um well, here in the context, uh, it, it's talking about the, the welcoming of the spies, the, that the spies, uh, Rahab brought the spies into Jericho. She was not killed with those who were disobedient. Um, I'm not sure if I'm getting the gist of the question, though. Not sure if I'm getting the, the gist of the question there. Uh, it, I yeah, think it, I mean, it, you know, that it, it's her faith that saved her because she she had faith in the God of Israel and she welcomed the spies and she showed her faith there by welcoming them. And, and because of that, she did not come under the judgment of God when the city was destroyed. Yeah, yeah. so there we have an example of a temporal deliverance, mm -hmm. but it also demonstrates her faith, right? She, she wasn't killed yeah. along with everybody else. Yeah. The, the because there doesn't pose a problem. Right? She yeah. wasn't killed along with everybody else because she hid the spies. And this is what the author of Hebrews is using to demonstrate the genuineness of her faith. Right. And... So all throughout the chapter, the, the the goal is to show what genuine faith looks like and and how person X did this by faith or that by faith or held out by faith or or you know what have you. So right. yeah, I, I don't think it poses any problem to right. uh, and if it does, I don't know how. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh all right. So let's see. Um Go ahead, uh, Anthony. I, I mean, one one thing here is uh, it uh, it doesn't say because. I mean, somebody could argue that uh, that's a a way of bringing out the force in English, but it doesn't have that in Greek. I mean, it doesn't. It just doesn't say that. Right. Dexamene means having received. Uh, so it says by faith or. You know, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those th having disobeyed, right? Ha having received the spies with peace, right? So she received the spies with peace. Others disobeyed. She didn't perish, and that's because she had faith. I mean, that's the basic right. gist of the passage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, does Arminianism contradict saved by grace because they believe a man chooses between serving him and serving one's sinful desires? Well, uh, both Anthony and I are, are Reformed. Uh, and so, or Calvinist is another way to put it. Um, the Arminians officially, I mean, they, 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 they claim they believe in salvation by grace alone. But th the difference between my position and, and Anthony's and my position with theirs is that they believe that man, uh, man cooperates with God in this respect. And that man accepts Christ and, and repents and he willfully does this. And so in that sense, you have a synergistic view of salvation where where you cooperate with God. And that is very close to the Roman Catholic view. And that's one of the things that uh, Jacobus Arminius, when when he opposed the Reformed position, um, the Reformed, this came out in the Synod of Dort as well, the Reformed position basically said that the, the, the view of, of Jacobus Arminius is essentially the same as the Roman Catholic view, that it's synergistic at the end of the day, that, that you work alongside of God and you can lose your salvation. You could opt in and you can opt out. Uh, the Reformed view would say that it's monergistic. It's God alone. It's it's to the glory of God alone. God initiates. God raises us from our spiritual death. He gives us faith. He regenerates us, and He does it all for His glory. Um, so, 
uh, that that would be my position on it. So I do think that the Armenian posi Armenian position, I think, is is a weak position. I don't agree with that. Doesn't mean I don't believe my Armenian brothers and sisters are saved. I do believe they they are. Uh, Whitfield and Wesley, they had their their conflicts in this area, but they uh, Whitfield still regarded Wesley as a brother in the Lord, even though even though Wesley went against George George Whitfield's uh -huh. uh, request not to preach against predestination in this church. But anyway, at the end of the day, they, they were brothers in Christ. So you want to add to that, Anthony? Yeah, I would say this. With respect to justification by faith, Arminians believe that it's just it's faith in Christ that justifies. So we're not different there, although some Arminians will will waffle there a bit. But generally speaking, when we're talking about evangelical Arminians, they believe we're justified by faith. The difference that uh, Tony's bringing out is they view the faith by which we believe in Christ as our own contribution. And it's something that we're able to do, according to many Arminians, apart from the grace of God. Whereas interestingly, though, Wesley, to his credit, I think, even though this, I don't think, goes far enough, but Wesley, to his credit, unlike many Arminians, believed that grace was necessary to believe, but he believed that that grace was resistible. So anyways, yeah. the with respect to justification, though, I would say this, that we, if you're talking about a true evangelical Arminian, you know, Wesley would say we are justified by faith in Christ. Yeah. And as Reformed people and Arminians, we will want to argue about some things surrounding that but at least we can do so knowing who it is that justifies, right? We have trust in Christ, and then we can talk about the mechanics of that, right? We can talk about, like, I, it's a different, see, like, to me, like, I, I have, I know there are people that will debate all sorts of things with Roman Catholics, and I think there are all sorts of things that Rome's wrong on, that in one sense, as a debater, I'd love to debate. I'm still sort of resolved not to debate all those issues because I'm thinking, they're worthless to debate with a person who doesn't know the gospel and who's lost as a goose, right? So why am I going to debate whether people should pray the rosary if somebody doesn't know the gospel? That to me is a waste of time. Uh, you know, I'm going to call them to repentance and faith in Christ alone. With a Arminian, as a Calvinist, I have in common with them the, the faith in the gospel. So I believe we have room now to talk about these other things, right? I can talk to them about whether faith is a gift of God, whether it's something man can do apart from divine grace, or whether divine grace merely makes it possible for us to believe, but doesn't ultimately issue for it in believing. You know, we can talk about those things, and and uh, you know, but we do so, as Tony said, as brothers, as opposed to you know, we we, we do so as 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 brothers in faith in a common. Christ and gospel rather than two people who are on different sides of the divide yeah. uh, of the gospel, like we, like we is the case with Rome. Right. Right. Um, so just a, a, an answer to uh, Steve Christie, uh, Romans 830 uses glorified in the past tense. Doesn't this prove if one is justified, they will also be glorified, meaning the just cannot lose their salvation. Yeah. This is precisely what Paul's argument is with the chain of redemption. And he speaks of glorification as already something completed. And that's because from God's uh, vantage point, when God calls his people, he elects them, predestines them, he justifies them, and he glorifies them. In other words, it's a done deal. And, and that can only be said if, if God is able to hold his people and no one can snatch them out of his hand. And then Paul goes on to say, what can separate us from the love of God? It, it, neither death, nor height, nor width, nor angels, nor demons, nor powers to powers and things to come nothing in all creation can separate us from god's love and that is uh that is basically eternal security uh and and that link cannot be broken it's an unbroken chain and so uh the reason why paul uses glorification in the past there is to show that that what god has started the good work that he started he will finish uh and so uh i would agree yeah it's definitely talking about our eternal security you want to add to that anthony yeah, so I, I mentioned earlier uh, the possibility of debating Shadid Lewis on Isaiah 53. And one of the things that people bring up on Isaiah 53 to argue it's not about Jesus is that portions of it are in the past tense, right? Where it says uh, he was crushed for our iniquities, that sort of thing. Yeah. So the argument of some people is this isn't talking about Jesus. It's talking about some future or past individual. But right. as you know, in Hebrew, there's yeah. actually no such thing, technically speaking, as past and future tense. Mm -hmm. What you mm -hmm. have are aspect. You have yeah. the imperfect and perfect. And we can yeah. we can speak loosely and say past and future, but really what you have are completed action and incomplete action. Things are being portrayed in a certain way. 
And what's interesting, though, is prophecy is usually presented as a completed action. Not always. Sometimes it's it's incomplete. Like, in other words, it's portraying it as something as yet incomplete. But you can portray something that's yet future as completed action. And the only way to translate that into English is to render it in the past tense, right? But this is normally called the prophetic perfect. And yeah. the idea is because this is certain to happen, it's spoken of as completed action as if it happened already. Now, even Jews, I mean, I'm not just, you know, this is standard Hebrew, right? Yeah. I'm not, this is not yeah. a Christian apologetic maneuver that I'm making and, 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 and bringing this up. I could quote for you numerous rabbinic authorities, Rashi, even Ezra, one after the other talking about this. They recognize this is, this is just the Hebrew language. And, and so Paul, being a Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, is doing the same thing. He recognizes the certainty of those who God predestined, foreknew, called, justified, the, the certainty of them being glorified. And yeah. so as he's talking about them having been predestined, having been foreknown, having been called, having been justified, he just keeps on going and says, these he also glorified, right? Because this is just as certain as all those other things that are already passed. Uh, be, by virtue of being passed, we know those are certain, right? So in the same stroke, so is this. And another way of looking at it is like the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, right? Jesus didn't literally die before the foundation of the world, but it was ordained. Yeah. And so you can speak of it as though it happened then because it was as good as certain then. And and Paul's, yeah. And then and then you pointed out the, the real clincher, you know, which is, the whole context of Romans 8 it doesn't get any better than that, does it? Where yeah. Paul begins by saying, and, and, or not begins, but after talking about uh, those whom he called, uh, he justified, whom he justified, he glorified. Paul goes on looking back to all that, and he says, what shall we say to these things? Exactly. What things? All the stuff he just got through talking about, justification, calling, glorification. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Right. And then, you know, uh, it goes on, as you said, what can separate us from the love of God? And it never fails, no matter how comprehensive Paul is, people try to smuggle something in there. So you'll have people say, like, remember in John 10, how people will say, oh, yeah, Jesus said nobody can pluck uh, yeah. my sheep that I've given eternal life out of my hand. And then people will say, oh, but you can leave. Right. You can you can take yourself out of his hand. Well, I love that passage in Jeremiah where he talks about one of the promises of the new covenant is God says, I'll put my fear into their hearts yeah. so that they will never depart from me. Right. So so God right. is saying this is one of those things that he's going to do. So yeah. even if that were possible, God has cut that off by saying they're, yeah. they're never going to depart from me. But how much clearer could Paul be when he when he talks about nothing present, nothing future, yeah. nothing, you know, no, no matter how high, no matter how deep. No matter yeah. how wide, nothing, nothing in all of creation. Exactly. He, he seems to be driving at exhausting the possibilities there, yeah. uh, you know, that could separate us from the love of God in Christ. And and that all just flows from what we were talking about, the past tense, uh, yeah. you know, completed view of, of all that God is doing to yeah. save us. Yeah, it's, you know, when Paul talks about false brethren crept in unawares, and that happens a lot where. You know, Rome tries to sm smuggle in uh, the, the, these these false false ideas. Okay, uh, thank you, Agoy for Jesus. Uh, uh, thank they go with initial salvation as solution. So I stress uh, boast. So uh, I think we get the gist of what you're saying there, uh, Anthony. We'll make this our final question because uh, uh, someone said, "Oh, Anthony can go on for three hours," but you're still uh, you, you also have a living, and you know you got to work as well. So we want to be mindful of your time so folks we're going to take one more question i apologize if we missed any of yours uh we are going to make this one uh the last one there was a question here um let me see here there was a question here about um uh, i believe it was uh dr moose uh commentary on uh, james so let me just there it is uh Dr. Mu interprets James 2 as referring to final justification. Do you have any opinion on that idea? Doesn't that seem to close to the Catholic idea of initial justification and final? Okay, I'll give you my 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 bit, my uh, my two cents worth, and I'll let Anthony finish it. Uh, I don't think he's talking about final justification. I think James is talking about the relationship between faith and works, and I think he's talking about justification before men. Uh, so if you go to chapter 2, the beginning of chapter 2, he talks about 
um, if if a poor man comes into your and the Greek word is synagogue because uh, James is writing to Jewish believers. He says if they come into your synagogue and 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 because he's a poor man and you put him to the back of the of the of the synagogue, uh, are you not showing partiality? So he's talking about the way we act horizontally towards one another, uh, and I think the whole thrust of James two is to talk about <clears throat> once again the the true faith produces good works. Uh, uh, faith without works is dead, and and one of the ways that our works justify us is before men and not before God. So no, I I would I would not take the opinion that Doctor Moo presents there. Uh, go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, well, I'm curious how Moo would mean that. Um, I like Moo; he's got a lot of good stuff, uh, and I'm sure he's not denying the Protestant doctrine of justification. He's been too adamant in in you know pro sola fide and so forth sometimes when people talk about something like final justification in a protestant context what they're talking about is a final open public declaration of the fact that we are justified so they're not saying that uh there's there's two different like initially we're justified through faith and then finally good works are the grounds of justification they might just have in view the idea that at the end our good works are going to be instrumental in showing forth the reality of faith and that we were justified people. I mean, I'd be just interested in how Moo nuances that. And without reading that, I, I couldn't really give a, a good opinion. But I agree with Tony's interpretation. I could say that on James too, that that James is uh, talking about faith, true faith, in contrast to a said faith, producing good works. These good works vindicate our claims to faith Right, they justify us before men, but they can't possibly justify us before God, right? And Paul already de dealt with that, uh, yeah. so I, I don't think Paul's contradicting, no. or James is contradicting Paul. Okay, just uh, okay. I was going to end it there, uh, Anthony. Just, just, just an important question there. But before doing that, uh, Ben Shapiro says Isaiah fifty three is based on philosophical position. Why he believes that's not talking about Christ. Well, not only are Christians against him, but the rabbis are against him on that. Uh, I don't think the philosophical position, um, the rabbinic authorities, uh, the old ones believed it was about the Messiah. Rashi changed that by trying to move away from the Messiah and say it was Israel as a nation. Um, so I, I, I think Shapiro is wrong on that. Uh, and again, I'm not to not to not to diminish him. He's not a rabbinic authority. He's not a Jewish scholar in these areas. Uh, so anyway, you go ahead, uh, Anthony. Yeah, I'd be interested in in particular what his philosophical view is, because you uh, you know, you get Jews that are philosophical, but I'm not aware of what's meant by a philosophical position with respect to Isaiah 53. That's just not found in early Jewish stuff or later Jewish stuff. No. Uh, Maimonides tends to be pretty philosophical, but I don't. I'm not aware of him having a distinctive view. In you know contrast to somebody like Rashi or even Ezra or Radak or, or whoever, um, but I mean here's the thing. I, I I'll leave with this on Isaiah 53. The idea that it's trying to set forth some abstruse philosophical notion just strikes me as utterly desperate because I mean just read the text right. I <laughs> I have confidence in the text. And I, I don't mind if somebody reads the text and they walk away saying it's not Jesus. I think they're they're being dishonest and they know it, right? I mean, I just think it's that clear. And I'll give you an example of this. My father-in-law is Jewish. My wife is Jewish. When I met her, she was Jewish. She was 16. We both worked at a pizza place. Uh, I would come in from delivering a pizza and she'd ask me questions about Jesus. And I'd give her answers. And then one day I said, you should just go to church and hear the preaching. She went to church. She became a believer. And then we started courting and that brought me into no end of conflict with her family members. And some of them were practicing Jews. Some of them weren't. And her father used to always say, you know, I'm a Jew. I don't believe in Jesus. And I'd say, what does that have to do? What do those two things have to do? Why, why do you think being a Jew means you don't believe in Jesus? And he, he just kept repeating it like it's like it's just a dictum. Right. It's a it's a factual statement. Yeah. Well, anyways, we used to argue all the time. And I, I said to him one day, I said, hey. I said, Dave, good Jewish name, right? I said, Dave, I said, do you mind if I just read you something? I want, I'll get your honest response to it. And then I said, let's not argue about it. I just want your response to it. I might say one sentence or two, but we'll just leave it at that, right? And I already knew what I was up to, right? So I, I read, 
Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. And I said, what do you think about that? And he says, oh, I don't believe that. I go, what do you mean you don't believe that? And he says, yeah, he goes, I'm Jewish. I go, yeah. I said, but what are you talking about? What do you mean you don't believe that? And he says, all that stuff about Jesus. I said, what stuff about Jesus? He goes, all that stuff about him suffering and dying for people and being crucified and all that. And I said, Dave, you do realize I was reading to you from the Old Testament, right? Yeah. And his jaw just dropped. He had never even heard this text, mm -hmm. but not because he was a stranger to synagogue, but because the synagogues themselves have long since stricken this from their uh, orderly reading. They'll read through the Old Testament, the Tanakh, but this is struck from their, their synagogue readings. And so when he heard this, he just heard it for what it was, a, a very clear description of an individual suffering and dying on behalf of others, not on his own behalf, yeah. and, and so that they might be saved and forgiven. I mean, that's as clear as day, yeah. and he saw it. So I, I really just yeah. think some people are just warring with God, warring with themselves, fighting hard not to see the obvious, and... You know, yeah. uh, the philosophical position who reads Isaiah 52 and thinks, yeah. oh, there's some deep Aristotelian yeah. notion yeah. that yeah. Isaiah is trying to convey here. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's silly. OK, <laughs> <laughs> very last one. I would like to know how you both understood Hebrews 12, 4 to 17. OK, so Hebrews 12, uh, 4 to 17 is talking about to, to pursue holiness without holiness. No man shall see the Lord. And then it gives the example of Esau selling his birthright and so forth. So. In Scripture, we are given uh, uh, prescriptive uh, commands. So we've got descriptive commands or descriptive um, designations of God and the way he redeems his people. But the Bible also has prescriptive commands. Prescriptive commands are divine commands that God gives to his people. It warns us about falling back. It warns us against apostasy. And so that does not imply that God's people will lose their salvation, but these are these are part of God's uh, divine commands, prescriptive commands that he gives to us to keep us on the straight and narrow. Right. And so uh, we need to live in holiness. Without holiness, we will not see the Lord. And that is why God needs to sanctify us. He has to give us his holiness. Uh, and so um, it doesn't it doesn't mean that you're incapable or that that you're not going to be able to live a holy life. These warnings are there for a reason, and that is to keep us, again, uh, uh, alert. It's to keep us obedient to God. It's to keep us walking on the straight and narrow path. And uh, and so as, as people who are still in the flesh, living in this world, we need these, these commands from God. We need these warnings and so forth. You want to add to that, Anthony? Yeah. In this broadcast, we've been focused <coughs> on justification, but neither one of us, Tony or myself, or and I'm sure the person asking the question as well, uh, but we don't think that salvation is restricted to justification, though it's a critically important part of it. We believe that Christ saves the whole person and does everything requisite to bring about our full reclamation. So when Adam fell, he fell not only in the sense that he now was judicially liable to God, he was guilty, subject to his wrath and curse and you know, ultimately going to die, uh, but he also became inwardly corrupt and that also has to be dealt with. And we believe that Christ then not only came to die for our sin, bear the punishment due to us, live a perfect life so that he did everything that the law of God requires of people for life. But we also believe that in all of that, he was securing the, the, the Holy spirit for his people as a gift. And the spirit would come and circumcise the heart, write the law of God on the heart, enable new obedience and that sort of thing. And we believe this is part of the package of salvation too. So I don't have any problem with any text that talks about the fact of sanctification and the necessity of sanctification. I just don't think that sanctification comes before justification or that it's the grounds of justification. It's always the outflow. And even that is ultimately through faith in Christ, right? We, we have the spirit by faith, not by works of the law. The Spirit works in us and will continue to work in us. And therefore, we are called to work out our salvation. Not for it, work it out. The Spirit has been given to us. And now we have all the resources we need to pursue greater conformity to Christ. So I, I don't see, I mean, at no point does Scripture ever say that this is the, the meritorious grounds or it, it use the language. I'm not just, I'm not trying to, you know, play the, 
where's this word used? I'm, I'm saying conceptually, you don't ever find that. Right. Justification is always grounded on Christ's redemptive work. Sanctification is always something that is subsequent to or the outflow of that. And it's never made the meritorious grounds of anything, though it is surely and certainly the reality in the case of those that are justified, right? Those that are justified are being sanctified and will ultimately be glorified. Think about it this way. Glorification is sanctification completed, yeah. right? And sanctification is glorification begun. So if we believe we're going to be glorified, well, then necessarily, I mean, sanctification is the beginning of that. And, 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 and that's its terminus that, I mean, that's its end. And so, yeah, I believe everybody that's been called and justified will be glorified, which also means I think they will also be sanctified because that's what glorification is the conclusion of. Right. So yeah, there's, there's no problem on this view of saying without holiness, no man will see the Lord, yeah. right? But it, it's an inwrought yeah. holiness and it's not the ground of justification. Yeah. yeah. And Hebrews is also, very much like James, it's trying to show you who's in and who's out. Uh, those who don't live holy lives, um, again, there's no there's no fruit to their faith, and so uh, the New Testament letters are also uh, they're also dividing lines. They're telling you who's in, who's out. James says those who are in are those who have faith and produce works. Those who are out are those who have faith but have no works. And so, and John says whoever loves God and loves his brother, the the love of God resides in them. The one who who doesn't love his brother. It does not have the love of God. So the scripture has this dividing line uh, uh, undercurrent to it that it tells us that these are what these are the signs that we ought to look for uh, in God's people. So, uh, Anthony, I just want to thank you so much for giving up uh, your time. I think this is the longest live stream I've ever had. Uh, uh -huh. But I thank you. And the reason for that is because this is a hill that you and I will die on. Justification by faith alone is 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 part and parcel part of the heart, the, the gospel. It's part and parcel. Uh, of the gospel. It, it's the gospel of Christ. It is central to the gospel of grace. And therefore, uh, th this is why, you know, we had to really invest a lot of time in this because this is a hill to die on. Uh, so Anthony, I just want to thank you so much, brother, for giving up your time. You know, you, you're a busy man and, you know, you got your life as well, your work and all that. So I just want to thank you for taking up a valuable time to, to be with us and to discuss this very important topic. Yeah, well, I love to talk about it. It's a delight to be on. Oh, yeah. Um, and I hope the debate happens. Uh, yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> let's hope so. And I'd love to have you on again, Anthony. We'd love to have you on again. Yeah, of course. So everyone, thanks for joining us. And uh, again, don't, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like the video. And we'll see you again next time, if the Lord wills. Take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.